Alright, so I guess we can start, yeah? It's 9 o'clock now, uh, Malaysia time. A very good morning and selamat pagi. Yang berbahagia Associate Professor Technologies Dr. Ramza Dambul, the Deputy Vice Chancellor of Research and Innovation, University Malaysia Sabah. Yang berbahagia Professor Datuk Dr. Haji Kasim Haji Mat Mansur, the professor and also the dean of the Faculty of Business, Economics and Accountancy, University of Malaysia Sabah, the Honorable Professor Dr. Maraktas S. V. Amante, professor from the School of Labor and Industrial Relations, University of Philippines, Diliman, the keynote speaker for today's seminar, Distinguished guest speakers, Yang Brusaha Professor Dr. Durisha Binti Idrus and Yang Berbahagia Datuk Haji Samsudin Bardan. Yang Brusaha Dr. Rosalie Asid, the Deputy Dean of Research and Innovation of the Faculty of Business, Economics and Accountancy, University of Malaysia Sabah. Yang Brusaha Dr. Beatrice Lim Fu Yi and Yang Brusaha Dr. Borhan Saria Abdullah organizing chairs, seminar participants, organizing committee members, our industry partners, university and faculty members and fellow students. On behalf of the organizing committee, I would like to welcome all participants and attendees to the International Seminar on Human Resource Economics 2021 with the theme security in work after COVID-19 pandemic and just for everyone's information this seminar is an initiative and organized by the human resource economics program of the faculty of business economics and accountancy university malaysia sabah before we start with our seminar, I would like to remind our participants and attendees on several important issues. The first one is to everyone. Um, we'd like you to mute your microphone during the keynote presentations and also the speeches by our respective speakers. 
And this is actually to avoid unnecessary echoes. Secondly, if you have any questions or you need clarifications from our speakers or panelists, feel free to write this question in the chat box. And for everyone's information, this seminar is also being streamed online in Facebook. So please search for the Faculty of Business Economics and Accountancy Facebook account, and you can watch us um, through Facebook Live. And we also would like to encourage everyone to share this Facebook live streaming with your colleagues, your friends, and also your network. Thank you. Um, so first and foremost, to open this seminar, I would like to invite Professor Dr. Haji Kasim Hajimat Mansur, the Dean of the Faculty of Business and Economic, Business Economics and Accountancy for the welcoming remarks. Professor Datu Dr. Kasim is also the Professor of Economics in the faculty. Professor Datu Dr. Haji Kasim, please. Datu. I think there's something wrong with uh, Professor Datu uh, line. Let me check with the secretariat, yeah? Yes, okay, yeah. Professor Datu Dr. Haji Kasim, I think, is now online. Yes. Can you hear me? Yes, Prof. Yeah, we can Prof. Hear, yeah. hear you loud and clear. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. yeah. Sorry about it. Uh, thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much, Dr. Oscar. Uh, Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh and very good morning. Yang berbahagia Profesor Teknologis Dr. Ramza Dambul, VPT Vice Chancellor Research and Innovation of UMS. Yang berbahagia Datu Haji Samsudin Bardin, Executive Director Malaysian Employer Federation (MEF). Profesor Dr. Maragatas S.B. Amanti. School of Labor and Industrial Relations, University of the Philippines. Yang berbahagia Profesor Dr. Duriza Binti Idrus, Faculty Technology and Informatik Razak, University Technology Malaysia. Distinguished guests, presenters, participants, my dear colleagues, ladies and gentlemen. First and foremost, I would like to welcome you to our Faculty of Business, Economics and Accountancy, UMS, where scholars and researchers in partnership with industry, our universities, friends and students all gathered here today online. First and foremost, also, I would like to record our thanks and appreciation to Yang Berbagia, Professor Ramza Dambul, PPT Vice Chancellor Research and Innovation of UMS for the support and willing to spend your busy time attending and officiating this seminar this morning. I am honored to welcome you to join our seminar and wish that all of us participating will be more enriched at the end of our encounters. In particular, I would also like to thank our keynote speakers, 
Professor Dr. Maragatas S.V. Amanti. Our panels, Professor Dr. Durisha Idrus. And also yang berbahagia Datuk Haji Samsudin Badan for joining us today. It is also honor for us to welcome representatives from both states and federal government and other government linked companies and agencies. And I would like to greet the representative from the academics, top management and faculty management and students. Um, ladies and gentlemen, um, I would also like to begin by giving a brief introduction to International Seminar on Human Resource Economics of 2021. Um, this morning, our delegation is here to discuss one of the most aggravating issues in the world. We all know that with so many labor issues in ASEAN and Malaysia in particular, it is important to give an overview of current situation of the labor market in Malaysia in particular. In addition, uh, this um, seminar is also a catalyst to, inc to inc encourage students. I would like, uh, especially, uh, especially the postgraduate student and the faculty involvement in research and academic and academic discourse activities. The, expert, ex uh, the expertise and knowledge that the speaker will share will give the audience more exposure to the topics being addressed and discussed. And one of the objective of this seminar is to highlight the labor issues during pandemic to assist and for policy formulation and, and government action. Uh, again, I would like to take this opportunity to thank our keynote speaker, Professor Maragatas, our panelists, Professor Dr. Durisha Idrus, uh, Datu Tuan Haji, Datu Haji Sham, Sudin, Bardan for taking time off from their busy schedule to be presented here today. Um, their presence is a great honor for UMS, in particular our Faculty of Business, Economics and Accountancy, and I believe it reflects strong collaboration and networking among academia and industry. And on behalf of the Faculty of Business, Economics, and Accountancy of UMS, I would also like to congratulate the Organizing Committee on International Seminar on Human Resource Economics of 2021 for their tremendous efforts in organizing the seminar. I hope the seminar will accomplish all of its aim and objectives. And I will also like to acknowledge our Deputy Vice Chancellor, Professor Dr. Technologist Ramza Dambul, for willing for coming and officiating this seminar today. And finally, I do hope that you will enjoy the seminar today and have a blessed day. With that, Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Dr. Dr. Kasim, for the warm welcoming remarks. And we hope that all participants uh, yeah, will have a fruitful time during this uh, seminar today. And next, without further ado, I would like to invite Associate Professor Technologist Dr. Ramza Dambul, the Deputy Vice Chancellor of Research and Innovation, University of Malaysia Sabah, to officially open and inaugurated the International Seminar on Human Resource Economics, Security in Work After COVID-19 Pandemic. Yang, yang Berbahagia Associate Professor Technologies, Dr. Ramza, please. Oh, thank you very much, Dr. Oliver. Assalamualaikum and very good morning, everybody. I hope that my voice is clear. Is it okay, Dr. Oliver? Okay, Prof. Oscar, sorry, yeah. Dr. Oscar. Yeah. <laughs> I always confuse you between, uh, doc, because we have another, uh, yeah. we have another colleague, Dr. Oliver. Okay. Yeah. Anyway, um, yang berbahagia, Professor Datuk Dr. Kasim Haji Mansur, the Dean, Faculty of Business, Economics and Accountancy, University of Malaysia Sabah. Yang berbahagia, Datuk Haji Samsudin Badan, Executive Director, Malaysian Employer Federation. Uh, 
yang berbahagia Profesor Dr. Magata, uh, Maragatas S.B. Amante, uh, Professor of School of Labor and Industrial Relations, University of the Philippines. Uh, my best friend yang berusaha berbahagia Profesor Dr. Durisha Biti Idrus, uh, Professor from Faculty Technology Informatik Kraza University, Technology Malaysia. Thank you, Prof. Yep. You look very radiant this morning, uh, Prof. <laughs> or, as always. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you so much to all these panelists and our keynote address, uh, uh, keynote speaker uh, for uh, for uh, joining us in this seminar uh, today. Um, uh, once again, a very good morning to everyone and a very warm welcome to uh, our delegates, colleagues, ladies and gentlemen. I'm very, very pleased to be here today. Uh, for the opening of this seminar, the International Seminar on Human Resource Economics 2021 uh, by the Human Resource Economics Program, Faculty of Business Economics and Accountancy, University of Malaysia, Sabah. Uh, we are all aware that the global economy was hit uh, by an extreme demand and supply issues uh, as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic. We have many workers being laid off as a result of the declining sales and also uh, because of the suspended operation. Workers in the informal sector have it even harder because they lack of social safety nets to shield them from an expected event of this magnitude. The COVID-19 pandemic has also had a significant uh, effect on how people live and work, how organizations function, and how businesses and communities operate. Working practices have had to be adapted to comply with the travel restriction, social distancing measures, and other health and hygiene protocols associated with the effort to deal with this uh, unprecedented pandemic. The resilience of our societies following COVID-19 is uncertain at this time. Rebuilding economies would definitely need tremendous effort, resources, and expertise. Ensuring that the recovery is rapid and sustained and rebuilding a more resilient and inclusive labor market would be very, very challenging. Therefore, it is critical to investigate uh, the ongoing adjustment in, in the workplace, uh, labor policy, and possible uh, recovery uh, from the COVID-19 uh, crisis. Um, this international seminar offers a forum for scholars, industry actors, policymakers, and society as a whole to address the work industrial relation nexus in the light of COVID-19 uh, pandemic, yeah, the impact of this unprecedented uh, pandemic. We also, um, therefore, I think that the exchange idea from this seminar can be an avenue to uh, develop a balanced and acceptable sectoral and national policy responses, and hopefully uh, would be able to shape sustainable recovery in the medium terms or even probably long term. Eh? I believe that the organizing committee of this seminar has outlined and will bring to the table a lot of issues on this topic, and that will benefit uh, all of us, um, the academia, the industry players, and also the society at large. Eh? So um, um, I'm sure that everything is already well arranged. It seems that I can see uh, the, the organizing committee is well prepared. So I wish everyone um, would be having a very productive seminar. On that note, I hereby declare the International Seminar on Human Resource Economic 2021 officially open. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you so much, uh, Associate Professor Technologies, Dr. Ramza, for the officiating and the opening speech of this uh, seminar. Yeah, And uh, on behalf of the organizing committee, we appreciate it, uh, your support, Prof, yeah, by spending time with us this morning, despite your busy schedule. Thank you so much. So for the next session, 
Yeah, it will be the keynote speech by our esteemed keynote speaker, the Honorable Professor Dr. Maratas S. V. Amante, is a professor in the School of Labor and Industrial Relations, University of Philippines, Diliman. Just a brief introduction to our keynote speaker. Yeah before I invite uh, Professor Amante to deliver his keynote speech. Professor Amante holds a PhD in Labor and Industrial Relations from Keio University, Tokyo, Japan. A master degree in Policy Economics from the University of Illinois, USA, and a Bachelor of Arts in Economics from the University of the Philippines School of Economics. Throughout his academic career, he holds several prominent positions in the academic arena in the Philippines and the Asian region. Um, to note a few, Professor Amante was the Vice President of Administration of the University of Philippines Diliman from 2011 until 2017. He was also a professor at the College of Economics and Business of the Hanyang University in Seoul, South Korea, a research fellow at the Seafarers International Research Center, SIRC, Cardiff University, Wales, United Kingdom. He is also a consultant and a facilitator for the ASEAN Secretariat and the Japan and the Japan Ministry of Health, Labor, and Welfare. He was also a visiting professor at the Shanghai Open University. And recently, he is the chair of the 10 International Labor and Employment Relations Association ILERA Asia Congress 2020. And his area of research include emerging patterns of work, performance and pay, and new forms of employment relations. And for this international seminar, Professor Amante will be delivering a keynote speech entitled Emerging Challenges to Employment Relations, Digital Work Democracy, Security and Decommodization. And without further ado, let us welcome and invite Professor Dr. Maratga, Maraktas S. V. Amante to deliver the keynote speech. Just to make sure I'm being heard, good morning. Yeah, Everyone. good morning, Prof. Yes, we can hear you Thank loud you. and clear. Thank you for the warm words of welcome. Professor Dusin and uh, uh, the Dean and the uh, uh, Professor Ramsul. And I, uh, Professor Ramsa Dambul, yes. So thank you very much I, for the uh, warm welcome. Um, we we in the school of labor and industrial relations have been discussing how uh, what would be the ways we could uh, see you and i we thank you for your active participation during the uh, uh, 10th asian uh, regional conference on labor and employment relations last december rescheduled because of covid we really we would like to see you um, we, and and uh, hope to to have you here in in Manila in Quezon City and uh, perhaps later on, we, our our team, our professors, our students would also would like to see you. Um, you're you're very close, you see. Uh, just down there, I think uh, maybe the one hour, two hours flight. Ah, I, I, I could see uh, an old friend, uh, Dr. Professor Bala, uh, has just joined. Uh, I really miss him as well. I have not seen him for some time. So this would be this. 
You okay? Uh, good. Yes, good to see yes, you. Yeah. Good to hear Love from you. you. Yeah, I, yeah, I yeah. saw your yeah. name. You just joined. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, Paul. Yeah, nice. so uh, we we really um, uh, after this year maybe um, we could we could see how we could uh, have a more active uh, academic uh, co co cooperation, uh, maybe exchange. Huh? Because it is important for our two countries to really, I think we are very close as far uh, in terms of temperament, in terms of uh, value systems. And now um, the topic that is assigned to us is how do we, because Dr. Bala, we have been together in so many international meetings. And uh, we have been wrestling with these ideas um of the world of work and now COVID-19 has really forced us uh, to undertake these uh, online meetings and to uh, rethink so what my I I will I I I'm 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 sure the the slides will be available for you uh, but I will not walk uh, I will need to discuss its page I would rather prefer to highlight the ideas uh, because the seminar is entitled Human Resource Economics. And uh, we are particularly uh, dealing with the human resources. And as you know, there is now a strong call to reinvent, to innovate our world of work because of uh, COVID, so we now have a lot of online digital work. So that's, uh, that's I hope, would be the, the most prominent part. Um, the ideas, the systems that have been worked out as a result of uh, what you call industrial uh, progress, industrial revolution, and we have to acknowledge these ideas came from the West. Um, the way that the West designed, invented the world of work, providing us uh, the framework on how we work together and how I appreciate my work, how high I value my work and the work of others, the colleagues, we call that um, job, job tasks, duties, responsibilities that we break down. And as you know, technology is now clearly upon us. And uh, before COVID, there were a lot of talk about Industry 4. But before Industry 4, there is Industry 1. And uh, we all know where it came from. And the Industrial Revolution uh, was invented. Capitalism was invented in, in England, in Europe. <laughs> And then came down to us via colonialism, you see, I mean, um, the Philippines was a colony of Spain, then later in the United States, of course, you, you, you were also a colony of a, uh, the mighty empire called Britain, Great Britain. And so a lot of our issues and our problems now are traced to that period and we still have to deal with that now. Industrial revolution and digital work and digital labor uh, has the promise has the promise to open to us a new world of work. How we measure it, how we appreciate it, and how digital work, for example, uh, translates into digital labor, meaning the valuation of labor that is our concern now. And we hope to really work together and uh, rethink this issue. This this. Uh, this uh, the world of work, huh? how we design and how we invent work. I'm just giving you uh, some images now to remind us uh, where uh, the world of work, uh, the concepts, the measures, we call it human resources uh, came from. Uh, as you know, uh, my contention is that technology is quite pervasive and uh, as uh, at the start, there was a big movement in uh, in England. Uh, the, we call it the Luddites, anti-technology. But now, of course, I, I'm not a Luddite myself. I, I I love technology. I love the smart gadgets. <laughs> 
of course, I, I failed in changing my backdrop. So you are better at doing that. <laughs> but now I discovered my memory. I have to upgrade my computer. So that's Lou, 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 uh, Ludites for me. I mean, I'm a senior citizen, but uh, I still appreciate technology. I love technology and I would like to make technology create a better world of work. But you know that uh, these problems uh, of, uh, of our relationship with technology and the system that created uh, allowed it to flourish has given us uh, uh, a lot of uh, inter, you might say, interface with other values, with other fields. Now, of course, uh, Everyone uh, might have heard of this person, of this scholar, but he was the one, the only one, the only person writing about what's going on at the time uh, in England. He was writing his books in the British Museum, I discovered. He was a, a German, but uh, he was looking at capital, the system of capital, and wrote uh, what it all means. And it seems that uh, the popularity, I mean, before COVID, this, this scholar was also very popular no? uh, in reviewing the ideas of uh, Karl Marx and the system of capitalism, which brought to us the, 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 the system of the jobs and work and the labor and employment relations, as well as the, uh, the, the body, the web of rules and regulations that uh, make us or allow us to uh, work together and to create a value. So I'm just uh, highlighting some of the issues that now uh, arise because um, uh, many people may not have, uh, may not be familiar with the, with the works of Marx, but it is now important to see and to review whether uh, we could uh, have use for his ideas and do not repeat the same mistakes because he seems to have written a lot uh, about the, our world, our world of work and the role of technology, the uh, machinery, the uh, the system of uh, um, of uh, uh, the methods of work and how we interact with the equipment, with the machinery, with the uh, and the systems that we create. We call it a human resource management system. So uh, this, this, these ideas uh, need to be looked at and to be re-examined. So this was before COVID, yeah? so to commemorate the uh, 150 years of uh, Das Kapital, no? the, uh, the, uh, uh, the uh, work of Marx in 1857, published. So that was 2017, now it's 2021. Um, these are not in his books, but maybe he summarizes everything here and the motion. Uh, the way we create work, the way we do work, and the way we uh, value our work, we pay each other in terms of wages, salaries, and compensation. Uh, these are the basic equations, as you know. And we have to be familiar with the basic equations because it seems that these basic equations, of course, we know uh, we, a lot of us are in the faculty of accounting, uh, debit credit, <laughs> and financial management, and the world of uh, rate of return and uh, the, the return to capital. Uh, ROI is very important to us. So uh, these are the basic equations that uh, we need to reconcile with our uh, world of accountancy. And I think a lot of scholars, a lot of academics are not doing this actually. That's why I have to, uh, to put it to your attention so that uh, when we discuss these matters with our colleagues from Europe, I don't know about the United States uh, or in Latin America or even in Africa, there are some uh, colleagues there working on these uh, questions on how, we, how do we actually reconcile these ideas that we are in the world of work, uh, digital work, and how we value the uh, la digital labor, like, like what we are doing now. I'm, I'm actually in my home, so I'm very sorry if my, dogs, uh, my, my dog uh, joined the seminar by barking. <laughs> uh, I have to make sure that the dog is quiet. It's, it's always beside me. Sometimes he likes to join the seminar by barking. 
So um, digital work, that's what we are. We are now existing in cyberspace and our interactions. Um, you see, uh, I'm so amazed at how you're able to prepare very well for the international conference and our, the way you use technology, you know, Professor Borhan and everyone, Professor Oscar Duzin, you were here uh, uh, during our webinar, online seminars. And uh, uh, now we have to see how we go back to the bedrock. Uh, of ideas with form. So, um, as you could see, these uh, ideas uh, go back to the Europeans. We have to look back at uh, the bedrock, the basic principles of uh, why we work. Why do we why 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 do we do hard labor? Uh, now uh, we are doing this in digital uh, work. Uh, doing cyber work, uh, app-based work, uh, technology-based work. A lot of us are doing uh, freelance work um, and using um, technology to achieve uh, nicer, better results. But we have to go back to the basic principles. And um, this was the enlightenment period. Uh, and, you know, I just have uh, to flush this image just, just to remind us the social contract is very important. Why do we work? And what is it uh, in my cyber work, in my lecture that interests you? So we do have rational expectations that these ideas uh, will work and will uh, create a better society. And once we build a uh, recover, of course, that's another topic uh, from COVID pandemic, uh, how do we sustain recovery? So our welcome remarks, our speakers offer just to welcome, uh, emphasize the theme. How do we move uh, our economies? How do we recover? Everyone is uh, now speaking of a K-shaped recovery. Uh, the owners of technology, those are able to, uh, to uh, use technology like what we are doing now, uh, doing uh, Cisco WebEx seminars. Uh, would be able to sustain recovery and be able to recover and gain our work, our jobs, those who are able to do cyber work, freelance work. But those who are outside the cyberspace, outside the digital work, of course, someone still has to plant, someone still has to take care of the, of the food the production, and someone still has to deliver, and someone still has to do the cleaning. So manual, physical work could not be digitalized. So how would that be in relation to uh, the equations of capitalism that we need to identify? So fortunately for us, there are uh, ancient 1800 texts like this that guided, uh, that guided or mitigated uh, the negative effects of the Industrial Revolution in the 1900s, uh, the late 1800s. So we have to go back to the ideas of industrial democracy and why trade unions were organized at that time. And uh, we, we owe it to uh, Sidney and Beatrice Webb, uh, who invented the concepts of uh, unionists, or, or you might say popularized. They are really they didn't really invent it because trade unions were already there. You just made sure that uh, it is in the correct direction uh, to uh, collective bargaining and to collective negotiations to improve the terms and conditions of work. Because the other side of that, as you know, there was a lot of social ferment and social revolution created by the ideas of Marx, because Marx said, uh, you know, uh, this problem between labor and capital will, will, not be, will not be solved because the contradictions will remain, the inequalities will remain. So you, you need to take political power. The workers need to take political power but uh, Sydney and Beatrice Webb, no, 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 uh, we could negotiate, we could talk, we could have social dialogue and trade unions, uh, could do collective bargaining and uh, the negotiations. So we are now interested, that's what's happening with the voice of the trade unions. Here's another scholar, I hope you, are, uh, you, will, uh, you have his books in your uh, library. Uh, we have a very old library, I have not uh, visited because of COVID, but uh, we, we do have the books. I think yeah, the books are online as well, so you better grab a copy because of, uh, I think, uh, free copyright, no? 
uh, and uh, in in the uh, as a as a reaction to those uh, to the inequalities to the uh, to the um, inhumanity of uh, industrial revolution imagine uh, a lot of abuse and exploitation going on uh, while uh, a uh, surplus value was created at the time in Europe so it it came to us uh, in in the Philippines by way of the of the Catholic religion these ideas and the way that uh, trade unions appeared in the Philippines. No? So because of Spanish uh, if, effect or Spanish colonialism, um, I, I still have to uh, be familiar with how trade unions came to Malaysia, to Singapore and the uh, dominions uh, of the British Empire. Singapore, of course, included and how, uh, how we now so this slide just uh, emphasizes uh, to us what are the key points that we need to be reminded of. When we uh, talk about digital labor and digital work and how we recover from the pandemic, you see the dignity of work is still very important. Voice, uh, voice and representation is very important. And as you know, uh, Marx, Brentano, the webs, and uh, all the other social thinkers at the time warned about the inequality, the exploitation that was going on at the time. And because people didn't listen, the inequalities worsened. I don't know what happened, but there were wars. There were world wars. Aside from the Spanish, there was a Spanish pandemic at the same time in 1918, 1919. And uh, the Spanish pandemic uh, was spread uh, by, by a, a lot of soldiers going to war, as you know. Actually, a lot of the uh, viruses, the Spanish flu virus came from uh, Europe and the United States, but they are all going to war and they have to go to ships, <laughs> on board ships. So it was, very, it was then that the, the flu spread all over the world and killed them. I think more than 10 million or maybe 20 million people. Uh, so you have to be warned. All right, so I still have time. I, I hope to stop talking in a while, but I would just like to point out that we need to interface, to think about how human resource management and human resource economics will uh, reconcile with, uh, with our world of labor and employment relations, because these two fields seem to be uh, different words. I would, uh, I mean, human resource economics is it's about economics. Uh, labor and employment relations is about social relations. Uh, well, a lot of political economy as well. And a lot of law. Uh, lawyers need to come in because they, we, have, we do have national rules and regulations. But uh, where do national rules and regulations in labor and employment come from? They come from uh, the ideas of uh, fairness and justice and equity. So I'm still confident that there would be some general theory. Uh, maybe uh, we, that's why they are now, uh, of course, you are, in, uh, the, you are in the faculty of accountancy, accounting, and you have to make sure that the metrics, the human resource metrics are proper and done well. But you know, with the time of COVID, all these concepts about balancing debit and credit and benefits and cost and the rate of return to human capital, we have to uh, rethink. We have to reinvent. And uh, maybe, uh, maybe uh, some these younger people here attending the webinar would be able to to work out the necessary uh, integration, equivalent to what you call uh, the general theory, you know? the general theory of labor and employment in relation to human resource management. Yes, uh, how much time do I have left? Maybe I'll stop talking in a while. Uh, hi, uh, Prof, you have uh, another like 20 minutes. So, yeah. Oh, really? <laughs> but, but if you want to stop now, then, then it's fine. Yeah, yeah. All right. I, I'll yeah. just emphasize uh, the need uh, uh, because you see, these are what this is what happened. This is what we, how we experience. I don't know about you in Sabah or Malaysia. But uh, there were no human resource managers before, as you know, in industry one. They were only bosses, women. Personal managers came with Taylorism, with the Fordism, with the assembly line system of uh, work and jobs created. 
Then now we hear about people management, people support. And now we have to, there is a lot of talk, uh, not just in Europe, not just in uh, the United States, but even us with us here, how do we decommodify? How do we democratize? So we have to go back to the world of work because we have, we are concerned with our people who are out of work. How do we let them go back to work? Uh, so, of course, health and safety uh, protocols and uh, procedures are, are available. Uh, the vaccines, hopefully, would be available for everyone. So, that is um, the Industry 5 after COVID. I don't know uh, you in Sabah or you in University of Sabah, Malaysia. Or, but maybe we could work this out. How do this work out? The younger people, uh, you have to work this out. So but anyway, we are just pointing out where you could start, because as you could see, uh, we are dealing with Fordism and Taylorism, and you know, this was about cars, this was about the uh, assembly line system, but now we are doing digital work. Will there be digital Taylorism? Will there be digital Fordism? Uh, will there be, a, you might say, a, 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 uh, how do we value uh, and how do we price? Uh, the, the, what, the, what type of uh, human resource economics would be needed? So uh, these ideas from Taylor might help. I'll just skip through this because uh, this is sort of a reviewer. So I'll, 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 I'll skip this slide, but I would just like to point out to you that there is now a, a global effort. I don't know if you, I would like you or you, uh, we, our colleagues in Soler, in our School of Labor and University of the Philippines, would like to rethink these issues. And this is an open, of course, a lot of you are uh, presenting or doing uh, papers in the uh, International Labor Employment Relations Association. A lot of you are active there. So I hope you continue that, and we continue. Uh, we we continue to exchange ideas. How do we democratize? How do we decommodify? Well, as a result of COVID pandemic, as a way to sustain recovery from this pandemic and uh, similar uh, similar events, because people said this was a sw black swan event. No, I think ever ever since uh, after the uh, industrial revolution, these were predictable events. If we don't uh, pay attention, uh, there was a Spanish pandemic or Spanish flu in the 1900s, and uh, there were world wars and there were climate change. So we were we are adequately warned by scientists and uh, people. All right. So um, now we have to reconcile and interface with the ideas of human resource management because. Uh, human resource economics, uh, what does it mean? Of course, we deal with labor supply and demand, but right now, you know, the rules of the market um, is still there. We still have to contend with labor supply and demand, but uh, we don't worry about, there is no equilibrium, you know, uh, a lot of our economists are uh, so worried and so concerned and spend their lives trying to find the equilibrium between labor supply and demand, which you will never find. <laughs> So here in labor and employment relations, we always say that, but you know, you need to have decent work. You need to value the work people properly. And we need to uh, put the boundaries, even if we do digital work and digital labor, how do we jump from digital work to digital labor? Because labor is an evaluation, pricing, wage and salary systems. Digital work is just, duties, responsibilities, we're happy to do work, we're happy to do cyber work, we're happy to do digital work, but how do we measure that? And how do we value that? And who will benefit? Very important question. Who will benefit from this cyber work, digital work? Who will make a lot of money? <laughs> I hope you do. <laughs> so uh, we have to make sure that happens. So I'm just reviewing to you the field of human HRM it's management, as you see, it's about Taylorism, it's about Fordism, it's about factory management. And then now we are going to apply these ideas into digital work and digital labor? I don't think so. We have to rethink and revise and innovate. So that's, you know, these are the fields of HRM, the work. We have to innovate. We have to change. And how do we do this? How do we apply this to digital work, digital labor? There is a lot of reinvention. There is a lot of opportunity uh, for, for young people. 
to do this, uh, we call it strategic management. But you see, this was in the 1980s, 1990s. Uh, I'm just reviewing here the various models of HRM, which we now have to uh, check and validate. I hope uh, younger students, uh, younger academics, younger professors would be able to do this. You know, we have this, uh, what HRM model do you know? You have the console model, Boselli model, your value chain model, Harvard model, Orrich model, uh, Warwick model, et cetera, et cetera. So we have to go back to the bottom line. And now I, I, I jump a little bit because you see COVID pandemic, uh, ILO is telling us that uh, a lot of people lost jobs, but how do we recover? And uh, there would be slow job recovery. Uh, people are talking about K shape. So it's, uh, it's an exam for you. What is that K shape? Does it apply to you? And uh, in Malaysia, in the Philippines, yes. Uh, there's a lot of unequal recovery. Uh, those who are uh, the owners of capital, the owners of technology, the owners of uh, machinery equipment, the owners of Zoom, <laughs> the owners of WebEx Cisco will be richer. Uh, but what happens to, uh, to the rest? I hope they share. Is it a matter of sharing? Um, I'm just uh, sharing with you what do we mean by this. So I'll, I'll skip these slides because the challenge is really um, uh, to make sure we are not replaced by artificial intelligence. Of course, we are the master. We still do a lot of uh, control and manipulation. And, and, and just to point out, this is what is now going on in Europe. There's a lot of discussion about a new socio-ecological contract because of climate change. There's a lot of discussion about that. What, do, what does it mean? It is, means essentially the same ideas of the webs and the, uh, and the Leo the 13th, the socio-ecological contract, but uh, climate change added. And even with the, uh, digital uh, technology app-based work, it doesn't work. Uh, employer, employee relations uh, ideas still must, must apply. So I don't know uh, how these ideas will impact on the, these decisions of the UK, the France and the Spanish Supreme Courts will affect us here in the Philippines and you because you have got lots of this uh, Uber and uh, delivery and uh, uh, online work going on. But there is still employer employee relations and there is still workers' rights and there need to be decent work and uh, uh, to do. I think I'm at the end. So this is what's going on in Europe, uh, in the other uh, parts of the world at the moment. A lot of discussion from this and how do we talk about this? I think I'm now ready to, uh, to have an interaction with you. Uh, this is more or less a challenge. I really look forward that uh, we'll have, uh, this is an agenda. Uh, these questions uh, would be an agenda for us uh, here, even in East Asia. Of course, we do have lots of challenges in ASEAN, uh, but uh, Philippines, Malaysia, we could work together very well and uh, create a much, much better world of work and to integrate all of these ideas between economics, between management, between law and justice, and to create a better world. Um, who will be moderator? I think uh, I'm, uh, I'm done with my main message. Uh, sorry to, uh, to talk a lot, but I, I think I have time to, uh, to answer questions or I put in my email address or you could send it. Uh, we, could, uh, we could have um, more interaction through uh, email if you want. This is not right. the This is a beginning. <laughs> yeah, Thank you. The, Prof. Thank um, you very much, Prof. Yeah. Yes, yes. I'm done. I'm finished. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I will take over from here. Okay. So uh, again, we would like to uh, thank uh, Professor Dr. Marektas S. V. Avanti, okay, a professor from the School of Labor and Industrial Relations University of uh, Philippines for the uh, keynotes uh, uh, address just now. And yes, from the keynotes, so we believe that the uh, productivity and uh, uh, sort of like uh, jobs, okay, and po uh, positive employment relations 
can to be sustained okay to be sustained and uh, and work should be uh, decommoditized uh, and also uh, democratize democratize uh, democratize okay especially on uh, decision uh, about the job reassignment and also work, work design yes thank you very much prof again okay so um okay without uh, now is the uh, uh, photo session okay so uh, I would like to ask all participants and also uh, attendees to turn on uh, their cameras for the photo session. Oh yes, uh, before that we have like uh, one question. If I the question of employee, wait, uh, this is from Prof Bala. Yes, Prof Bala. Yeah, how are you? Good to hear from you. Yeah, there is a one uh, question from Prof Bala, I think. Yeah. Ah, uh, here I could read it in the chat. Yes, it is oh, on the chat. That, uh, I, I'm now opening the chat, and uh, I have the messages from Prof Bala, uh, whom I, uh, who, whom I have met in so many occasions, a uh, long, long time ago. But I have not heard from from him lately. I hope you are safe, and uh, you're a very strong man, and very, you're a big man. You're still a big, strong man, Professor Bala. So the question of employee voice for democracy from four to five. You see, this is. Uh, uh, a lot of people don't understand what unions are all about, <laughs> but I know there are a lot of unions in Malaysia and in Sabah. And so what's happening to them? Are we listening to them? Are the ideas also in, in sync, in, 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 in harmony with what we're talking about, the commoditization, because the voice and representation of uh, workers have to be reinvented. And we are happy to see that these are matters being discussed still at the ILO level, at the global level. But here at the national and the local level, we have to talk about it some more. So um, there is that gap, you see. Uh, human resource managers don't like unions, you see. Uh, I don't know why. Actually, I, I, I could not understand. But uh, in general, that's saying in general, because as you see, uh, Prof. Bala, the textbooks of uh, human resource managers are about Ford and Taylorism. <laughs> Division of labor have to be efficient in productivity, focus only on output over input and uh, all those other formulas which our accountants have to translate into uh, the bottom line called profit. And you know, in profit maximization, you have to minimize labor cost. So that is the Ford uh, equation, the Taylorist equation that made, uh, you know, Professor Taylor made uh, Mr. Henry Ford very, very rich because he organized the factory a lot. So now this is COVID. Of course, uh, we hear uh, our ideas came from the books, textbooks. So now we, do we still use the same textbooks? So yes, uh, James, uh, uh, the, the gig economy is still very strong in the Philippines. And so Professor Bala, I think uh, these discussions about digital work, digital labor will become more prominent. Uh, we need an integration. Uh, the uh, human resource management models are very important, yes, of course, uh, we, we hire people, we hire uh, labor, we hire workers to maximize uh, business uh, results called uh, surplus profit, right? But uh, we have to uh, watch the inequality. Um, there is a, we call it a phenomenon called Zoom burnout. <laughs> uh, too much uh, webinars. <laughs> Uh, actually, the rule is 20, 20, 20, 20 minutes, stay on the screen, 20, 20 seconds or maybe one minute, rest your eyes and don't listen, uh, rest your ears and your eyes and look at a distance of uh, maybe 20 feet. That's a 20, 20, 20 rule. That's the English system. It's not metric. See? So um, uh, now there is a lot of burnout. There's too much webinars, <laughs> so be careful about this uh, cyber work and cyber Zoom meetings. <laughs> uh, they might. Uh, I also sometimes uh, at the beginning I had a lot of these Zoom meetings <laughs> and these webinars, and so at some point I just have to stop and to rest. I hope you do. You sleep. <laughs> it's. Diff I think it's affecting our sleep patterns. I, I discovered. Uh, I, I I hope young people you take care of you. 
vaccination program, yes, uh, we only have 10 or 5 million yet. And uh, of course, we want everybody to be vaccinated. But you see, uh, as the WHO pointed out, it's still the vaccine uh, inequality. We do not control the technology. I hope you do have uh, pharmaceuticals companies, but you see, these are global pharmaceuticals controlling me. Uh, with the help of China, we do have, uh, my vaccine came from China, it was free, so thank you very much. Uh, but uh, you see, uh, there's a vaccine, uh, we want vaccination, but you see, uh, there's no supply, there's no vaccine. We want uh, product to produce the vaccines ourselves, but you know, we have to pay for technology, etc., etc. You have to pay for the licenses. Thank you. Uh, there is a uh, attendance form here. So I, I think that's all. Uh, this is not the, this is a beginning. Uh, we uh, in, in the University of South Malaysia and the Philippines, I hope we do uh, could uh, work together a lot on here uh, about these questions uh, to uh, interface the ideas of the economics, demand supply management and uh, labor laws uh, to achieve a decommoditization and a democratization of the workplace. Uh, that, uh, of course, that's ideal, that's utopian, but, uh, but uh, there's no harm trying. You know? We have to try, we have to do it. You know, Prof. Bala, uh, we have to, uh, we have to uh, let and uh, do it, uh, let these young people continue the work. Are you, I, I thought you, I'm about to, maybe two or three years from Bala, I'm retiring, so. <laughs> but you're still very young, right? Uh, we need your, you still have a lot of years to continue. To drive the HRIR in ASEAN countries. I think you are the guru. You are the most guru in ASEAN. <laughs> okay, bro. Yes, yes. Uh, we hope, but we have to continue. I mean, the job is not done. <laughs> Uh, well, now with the pandemic, it has shown us that we have to integrate the world of uh, human resource management and the human resource accounting seems to be different from the world of labor and employment relations where there is only one phase of work. There's only one person working. I mean, we are humans. We are people working. I mean, we, we do have economics, we do have management, we do have labor laws to take care of. Thank you. So thank you, uh, Prof. Borhan. And the younger colleagues here, uh, Dean, I thank you very much to the, our professor Dean who, uh, who offered us the welcome remarks a while ago. Uh, we hope to have some uh, cooperation later. Yeah? Uh, we hope to discuss. Thank you. Yeah. Thank, thank you very much, Prof. Yes, uh, we hope uh, we can have uh, uh, another club collaboration uh, maybe in uh, next time uh, in the future. Yeah. Okay. So uh, let's have a photo session before we go to the panel discussion. So I would like to inv invite all participants to turn on uh, your camera for photo session. Uh, maybe Dr. Andy, could you please take a, a picture of us? Yes. Thank you. Keep on smiling, Olive. Freestyle. Okay, uh, thank you uh, very much. So uh, I will pass this to uh, Dr. Oscar. Yes. Yeah, thank you so much, Dr. Borhan. Sorry, I mean, I had some trouble with uh, my uh, my computer just now, yeah. Um, yeah, and thank you so much again, uh, Prof. Amante, for the wonderful and fruitful sharing just now. Okay. Um, for the next session, yeah, uh, it will be a panel discussion yeah, on the topic of security in work after COVID-19 pandemic. And there will be three panelists, yeah, distinguished and um, renowned panelists to discuss uh, the topic. And our moderator for the session is Dr. James Allen. 
And for everyone's information, Dr. James is a senior lecturer in the Human Resource Economics Program of the Faculty of Business, Economics and Accountancy. He holds a PhD and Master's in Economics from the Yokohama National University, Japan. Dr. James also has published his academic works in several economics journals, book chapters and conference proceedings, among others. And some of his notable academic works include significant of experience, farm size, quantity of propu propagulis, and location of seaweed farmers in the divided islands of Sabatik Sabah. The economy of Sabah and Kalimantan towards greater economic interaction in Borneo and also a uh, big spending, small success, profit and loss analysis of Yushima seaweed farming in Green Island, Palawan, Philippines. Yeah, impactful work. And without a further ado, I would like to invite Dr. James Allen for the panel discussion. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman, Dr. Oscar. Can you hear me? Yes, doctor, loud and clear. Right. Yeah. Um, welcome to our panel session. Uh, I think by now we are warmed up by the uh, uh, keynote sp uh, speech just now by Professor Maragtas. Uh, I personally enjoy that uh, prof your uh, speech. Uh, so today uh, we have three distinguished uh, panelists with us. Uh, let me introduce them. Uh, <clears throat> the first panelist is uh, Professor Datu. Sorry, uh, Professor Datu Dr. Haji Kasim. Uh, he is our dean for the third time. Is that not, Prof? Uh, he is a very experienced uh, administrators, campus administrators. Uh, because he hold held a lot of uh, administration posts, both inside the campus and also outside. Uh, in addition to that, he also uh, very distinguished uh, scholars in the area of economics, particularly in uh, labor economics. He is well known work uh, in the area of development economics, uh, looking at the poverty. Uh, and also, um, he wrote a very special book on the Islamic approach to uh, labor economics, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, he published more than 100 uh, papers uh, and supervised maybe around 30 or 50, maybe, uh, in his uh, long career with the UMS. Uh, second speaker, uh, we have uh, equally uh, distinguished and well-known professor from UTM, University of Technology, Malaysia. I suppose the campus is in Johor, yes, Prof. Uh, professor Duresha actually is uh, well-known among my program. We always seek uh, her advice and guidance whenever we have some event like this. Thank you, Prof, for always giving us advice. We look to you as our mentor. Uh, Professor Durisha is uh, also a very distinguished uh, scholar in uh, management, human resource uh, management. So she actually sent a slides. Uh, the title of her slides is uh, COVID-19 impact on HRM. Uh, and uh, she uh, also uh, served both in UTM, inside UTM campus and also outside. Uh, very interesting is she is, uh, used to have the KPJ. KPJ is a private, one of the biggest private uh, health provider in Malaysia. Uh, very interesting profile. So uh, the third, and th this also, uh, uh, Dato Haji Samsudin uh, is now the president for 
employer federation uh, usually uh, in my class we talk about labor union employees but today we get to hear uh, from a industrial leader from Dato Samsudin uh, I think he will give us a very interesting uh, overview of uh, on the issue of job security uh, after the arrival or the spread of COVID pandemic. So with that introduction, may I invite uh, the first panelist, uh, Dato, Professor Dato, Dr. Haji Kasim, our Dean, Prof, please. No sound, Prof. Okay, th thank you very much, Dr. James, 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 for your kind introduction. Can you hear me now? Dr. James, can you hear me now? Yes, clear. Yes, Prof. Yeah, loud and clear. Hello, Dr. James. Hello, Dr. James. Can you hear me? Okay. Uh, yes, thank you very yes. much. Um, yes, um, I will present, I think uh, the time given to me is about 20 minutes. Um, okay. Um, our honorable uh, panelists, uh, Professor Dr. Durisa from UTM, Professor uh, uh, Dr. Amanti from University of the Philippines who just finished with your keynote uh, speak, uh, presentation just now, very interesting topic. Uh, Yang Burbagia, Dato Aji Samsudin Bardan, and all other participants, uh, um, participating in our conference this morning. Thank you very much. And my uh, topic of presentation is tuned to this to the, the theme of the the seminar, which is security in work after COVID nineteen. Uh, okay. Um, Now, um, next, uh, Dr. Borhan, uh, my contents of presentation, I will start with the introduction, a very brief on pandemic and, the, and after that followed by definition of job security. After that economic impact of COVID-19, a uh, very brief and uh, followed by uh, short-term and long-term consequences of COVID-19, and we will. I will also uh, mention about human resource and pandemic. Uh, then the role of technology in human resource, and what will be the future work uh, during this pandemic and of maybe after pandemic. And I will conclude it in in twenty minutes, inshallah. Um, now, uh, as an introduction, um, next, uh, Dr. Borhan, next slide is an introduction. We know that uh, COVID-19 pandemic has disrupted labor market globally. And as mentioned by Professor Amanti just now, um, the supply and demand of labor is in disequilibrium. Um, there's a need to find ingenious or smart solution to this problem. How we can make um, the labor market uh, equilibrium again? Because we know that COVID-19 has greatly shaken all organization. Um, meaning not only the government itself, but all the institution and and public and private sectors as well. 
and has created a complex and challenging environment uh, throughout, not only in ASEAN countries, but globally. So, so to ensure that the security of the workforce and the con continuity of job in the market has to be in a you know good program because this of course uh, COVID nineteen has altered as a kind of a signal to the institution or companies how we can help the employees to cope with this extraordinary crisis we are in having in a crisis actually and. In Malaysia, we keep the our honorable prime minister keep on saying that actually we are at war. You know, we are at war, fighting against this unseen uh, virus. You know, and there are no virus has been muted and become so many kind of viruses um, spreading all over. This is it will affect the labor market uh, definitely. Uh, it is what I also mentioned by. Uh, Honorable Professor Dr. Amanti just now. Now, uh, next, uh, Dr. Abraham. I think not only Malaysians government have um, implemented certain stimulus packages in confronting or in handling this pandemic. Um, as you can see from the slide, in, in the Malaysian government has introduced its Permakasa, that we call it Permakasa. Um, uh, Permakasa Plus, it, it was announced uh, early June this year. It's a stimulus economic package worth 40 billion ringgit Malaysia. And a few days ago, I think three days ago, another uh, economic stimulus packages has also been announced by the government. It involves 150 billion. We call it permuli. So this is also how to cushion, you know, uh, the impact of COVID-19. Because in recent months, most of ASEAN government in general, and of course in Malaysia in particular, have promptly released series of stimulus packages to dampen or to reduce the economic impact caused by this outbreak. Uh, for example, in Thailand has implemented a 140 billion baht, equivalent to United States 4.5 billion uh, US dollar. It's a stimulus packages also that will run from July to December this year to help sustain consumer purchasing power. Because now everybody got affected, our consumer purchasing powers are deteriorated. And then in Singapore recently, they prepared about sing dollar 800 million equivalent to united states 604 million okay us dollar to enhance support measures for individuals and companies and in vietnam has issued incentives in the form of tax break and land use fees to help businessmen reduce cost covid of I mean covid of 19 uh, covid 19 and May 1921, I think um, Professor Dr. Amanti know more about this. The Senate of the Philippines approved amendment to the Retail Trade Liberalization uh, RTLA or Senate Bills SB 1840. The minimum paid up capital requirements for foreign retail enterprises have been reduced from 2.5 million to 1 million US dollar. This is nothing but just to attract, you know, uh, business player coming to the coming to the Philippines. I think this is very interesting uh, kind of stimulus packages uh, introduced by the government of the Philippines. Uh, so the bottom line is that uh, what I'm trying to say on this slide is that the main objective of these stimulus packages are to increase public health care capacity. You know, and then to continue welfare program and support business. There are three major things that um, the main agenda of this um, uh, economic stimulus packages introduced by most government, okay, in ASEAN. I think most government glo globally also do the same. Um, how they can cushion so that, you know, uh, the public healthcare capacity can be safeguarded 
And then uh, continue welfare program because people are losing their jobs. And then the support business. Business are also during, we call it in Malaysia MCO, movement control order. Nobody is allowed to move around. So when there's nobody is allowed to move around, but it will affect the business community. Um, especially the small business players. Now, next, I would like to share with you the the the, the trend. Uh, next slide, uh, the trend of COVID nineteen cases. You can see that you can see that the increasing number of cases on a daily basis. You know, um, only March this year. Uh, it can be seen and can cause many problems to, for the growth of the world economy. This is globally, you know, not only in Asian countries, but this is the trend now. It indirectly affects the productivity of labor, definitely. Um, firm and a nation in the short and long term. In Malaysia, uh, during uh, total movement control order last year, started 18 March, you know, the, this um, estimation, the government were losing 2.5 billion daily ringgit Malaysia. And with the enforcement of MCO this year, it will affect the government coffer, what 1.5 billion. The government losing 1.5 billion a day. Imagine we're talking about months and years. So how much will will uh, will affect the the government's coffer um, because of this Im impact of COVID. And the next slide, I would like to share with you the total debts. Next slide, I would like to show you the total debts. Uh, you can see that the trends are coming up. It's going up. Uh, Dr. Borhan, uh, next slide. Yes, you can see that uh, the total debt in Malaysia is already reached 4,884. This data was uh, current number 26 June, three days ago. So the, the numbers are keep on climbing. So it's very alarming and warning. And then and 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 the next slide, and you can see the GDP growth, for example. Uh, we can see that when the first MCO was imposed last year, March 18, the lockdown, uh, we can see that the GDP bleed 2.4 billion a day, uh, as I mentioned just now. Uh, and the government eventually spent 55 billion uh, ringgit Malaysia across the year to ease the, the fallout. You know, to, to just to cushion the impact of uh, economic slowdown. The Malaysian economic shrank by 5.6% last year. And it, it was declined since the 1998 ASEAN financial crisis. This is very worrying. And we are hoping that uh, this year, 2021, um, the econo Malaysian economics growth will a little bit improve. And, and uh, most econ economists, uh, um, you know, uh, forecast, forecasted that the 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 shrink by three point five percent this year. And then uh, the next slide is just about the job security. Uh, very much tu tuned to the theme of this um, uh, the seminar today. Uh, when we talk about job security, job security is the probability that. An individual will keep their job. A job with a high level of security is such that a person with a job will have a small chance of losing it. So we are worrying about, uh, everybody are worrying about the job security. And according to Work Monitor Mobility Index by Stan Stan Malaysian, uh, Malaysia, more Malaysian being worried about their job security. You know, uh, rising to 13% from 6% in the last, in the past year. Um, 
and higher jobs insecurity facing workers during a pandemic. This is uh, one of the uh, most workers will, you know, will be confronting with uh, the, the insecurity job, such as fear of losing permanent job, fear of not getting a job for those who are graduates, for example, just finish their studies. You know, they are worried about getting a job. It's, it's not easy now. Financial concern and lack of digital skills. Uh, these are one of the things that um, uh, related to job security. So in general, during pandemic, uh, workers feel insecure about their jobs. You know, everybody worried. Lack of digital skills among all the workers in relation to the young generation also um, make, you know, senior workers are much more worried because, you know, because the, 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 the polarization of jobs are changing because of this pandemic. Now, we go to the next slide. Um, job insecurities talking about stress when we, when people are insecure about the job it will be very stressful even during this uh movement control order people are all stressed you know uh everybody stay keep you know with the family in the house it's not allowed to move around so uh, there is a survey by you got found that nine percent 92 percent of workers feel some level of stress over losing their jobs. And again, it's about losing job. In comparison with only 8% who reported feeling not, not at all stressed. You know, compared to people who are now stressed with people who are not stressed, the number of stressful people are keep on increasing. So in the event that loss their job tomorrow, 71% 71, 71 of the respondents believe it will be hard to find another one with similar pay and benefit, with 40% saying it will be somewhat difficult, while 31% believe it will be very difficult. So what does it indicate? It indicates something people are worrying about uh, job insecurity. Uh, next slide, I would like to mention about unemployment. Now, of course, during this pandemic, the, the, we have uh, short-term consequences and long-term consequences. Now, in short-term consequences, um, it is a sudden uh, impact. You know, people, millions of people will lay off. They were, you know, like, especially in the tourism industries, um how many people has been laid off because now the aviation industries are not allowed to travel you know so thousands of them uh others rapidly adjusted to working from home as office because the office are closed even some of the universities in malaysia now uh mostly in you know, uh, in, in Malaysia, for example, uh, most of the universities in Malaysia, we are only allowed to come uh, uh, restricted to 20% of the population at one time. You know, uh, but some institutions are fully closed. They're still not allowed to come to the campus. So others repeat adjusted uh, to working from home is one of the op best options. And many other uh, workers were deemed essential and continued to work in hospital, you know, um, medical doctors, for example. They have to go to the hospitals and the policemen, the armies, uh, these are the frontliners, uh, people who are working in the grocery, even, even you know, they are working, but they are re really not really secure, you know, when they are in the public domain um, be because of, you know, the virus. Um, and then we continue with the economic impact job related. Um, of course, as mentioned by Professor 
Dr. Amante just now, uh, some permanent jobs will be losing out. Okay, uh, temporary layoff. Some of some will be given a temporary layoff or unpaid leave for one month or certain period. Uh, declining hours of work. Of course, this is definite. Um, we used to work from eight to five, but now everybody's are working from home. Uh, undoubtedly, declining um, hours of work, working job below qualification. For example, there are some people, um, some graduates, you know, having very high level of education, but they have to do something, odd job, some, you know, be a grape driver or selling burger or something like that. Uh, in Malaysia, there are lots of examples, you know, uh, degree, degree holding um, workers doing e-hailing jobs. A pilot, a losing job in the aviation industries, now selling burger. This is not a job. This is the reality, you know. So people have to do lots of uh, different type of job. Or they call it multiple jobs. Um, taken on additional job. This is an, another option because uh, because of, you know, the um, source of income uh, has been um, deteriorated. Suspending active job search. Um, no point do the job search if there is no job openings. Which cut, this is also another scenario uh, confronted by most people globally. And now, move on to long-term consequences. Uh, next slide. Um, of course, um, the labor, labor demand and supply has been disrupted. It, it, what will happen in the labor market, it will be unbalanced disequilibrium labor market. Because there will be unemployment and under unemployment due to mismatch. This is happening. And then the mix of occupation. This is what they call it. We have gig economy mentioned by Professor Dr. Amanti just now. Gig economy or platform workers. More usage of apps, you know. You know, now the IT uh, application is uh, in a very highly a stage of usage. Um, the workforce skill required. This is what they call it digital skills are much more needed nowadays. And buying and consumption pattern also change. You know, online online purchasings are now become common and rampant, not used to be. Like, you know, those times, Amazon.com is a very small company in the United States. But because of buying online, Amazon.com in the United States, they are making tons and millions of dollars in profit. So because people are buying online, so what they call it, even the consumption pattern also change. Consumption on health concern. People are buying on health-related product. And another thing is that when the government announced like a policy movement control order, it will have impacted the general public. This is what they call it, panic buying. So when panic buying is happening among the community, this will make you know buying and consumption pattern change, and productivity and innovation. This is at the long term consequences. So what we need is upskilling and reskilling among workers to enhance productivity. Okay, now because time is very much uh, constrained, now I move on to human resource and and pandemic. What are the relationship with human resource and pandemic? As you can see from the slide, human resources is at the front lines of employers' response to the COVID-19 crisis. You know, this is what, why, you know, uh, labor is, is a major, one of the major factors of production, labor, capital, land, and entrepreneur. 
So this, there are two elements. These are very important um, important elements of factors production. So labor is at, at the forefront. Employees are the life blood of companies. Without employees, companies will collapse. So employees are the life blood of companies and determine whether companies thrive or wither on the vine. But in time of crisis, financial survival takes priority on over almost everything else. So this is how financial uh, priority is one of the most important things. Um, you know, uh, in today's life. Now, moving on to the role, the next uh, slide, the role of technology in human resource. Now, the crisis is forcing almost every institution or business operation to immediately develop, uh, adapt, or improve remote work. I know WFH now become common, uh, become a policy and procedures. So technology and communication infrastructure is needed for successful remote work for employees. Without technology, you cannot do anything, even if you stay at home. There must be a technology. So it's, it's become a necessity, not only necessary, but it's a necessity. And then this is how for the, the role of technology in human resource, we want to keep employees engaged enthused and productive is, is it uh this is one of the hr most valuable roles and often one of your our um you know our team supervis uh, supervisors so there are many research found that highly engaged team produce substantially better outcomes so we still have to engage with our employees even we are working from home me like you know like me as a dean of the faculty i have to engage with the faculty members because they are still um you know they are not in the uh, campus they are somewhere uh, in their own houses so we still have but because of technology we we watch up uh chatting so we can communicate so this make it easy so collaboration among all government department and other private sectors develop and implement new rules like you know uh cashless we are now in the cashless society example by using e-payment so um the government department have to think of how they can make use fully uh, e-payment because otherwise how the government can collect revenue you know uh, from the public or from the business players Visual communication platform using Google Meet and other things. These are now one of the things that human resource uh, department has to look into that. So the next uh, slide again, human resource role in monitoring and maintaining moral become even more crucial. So it is good idea to create a formal process for checking in with remote employees. When we're talking with remote employees, they're working from home and to ask how they are dealing with the added stress during the crisis. Now, people have been staying in the house for more than one year now. So it's very stressful. And to keep on top of any issues after things written to a new number. We want to, you know, make our employees at, at, at a normal mood, you know. So um, are they staying in touch with their colleagues and managers, these are some of the questions. Do you need anything to help uh, them uh, stay productive? So we want them to be productive. So are they aware of available emotional health resources and how to assess them? This is some of the questions um, by uh, HR had to respond to. So managers or head of department need to start on contingency plan. You must have a contingency plan and work policies for any duties need to be done on time. And then the next uh, slide is issues of content, office safety and security. Now, you know, business owners, of course, must focus on how to protect the workers' health and the workout plan to eventually return employees back to the office. We want to make them 
in a good uh, healthy situation and on, on the other hand institution organizational business uh, enterprises cannot ignore the health of the employees data system and employees record these are very important these are crucial because during this uh, work from home hackers and cyber criminals remain serious threat to companies and few weeks ago the Malaysian government reported that because of the cyber criminals, it caused uh, the general public almost 1 billion ringgit uh, Malaysia because of the cyber criminals. And this means that a focus on sanitizing station, when we talk about health, a focus on sanitizing station, workstation, huh? desk configuration, staggered schedules and enhanced cleaning schedule has to be in place and then the and the second one is how to protect data because the data might it have been uh, now more complicated because we are using uh, our laptop you know our laptop so most of the data are very uh, confidential so personal devices may be less secure than the laptops or this uh, top computers you might use while working in the office. Uh, the device you use while in the office benefit from security measures, uh, often put into place by companies, IT teams. You know, uh, these companies' devices are often protected by firewall and might automatically block certain IP addresses. But your personal devices, our personal devices are not protected are not protected, are not well protected because we are uh, lacking some features like this. This will, you know, unfortunately could provide opportunities for hackers to exploit our data, you know, uh, companies data. So, and then last but not least, uh, being in quarantine for long, for too long, staying home for too long, this also leave scammers they are also bored they also feel bored so they turn into cyber criminals that is why cyber criminals criminals are on the rise now Re result to uh, phishing attempts has been uh, on the rise since the covid 19 uh, pandemic okay this is what i, I said just now uh, in the first few months, because of these uh, cyber criminals, it it cost uh, the general public almost one billion ringgit. And um, so, the, all the meetings uh, online, such as Zoom, Microsoft Teams, Google Hangouts, uh, you know, all these services uh, provide a way for employees to connect. But while working from home. They can also provide up, um, a threat for hackers, actually. Now, moving on towards uh, the next slide, uh, reshaping future of work. What is, what is going to happen in the future? So, definitely technology with human-centric, you know. Um, we know uh, you, we are using robotic now, but with the elements of must be had some human centric must have feelings uh, this is we leave it to the people who are on this um uh, area technologies you know say how they can put their feelings on the technology so that technology with human centric um and then uh, the next point on the slide is that creating future work trend uh, definitely, we cannot run away from hybrid working model, you know, human with intelligent, uh, uh, artificial intelligence, AI, 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 and technology collaboration, digitalization, uh, digitization, you know, emerging number of contingent workers, gig workers, freelance. This is also mentioned by Professor Dr. Amanti just now. Um, very quick, I know Dr. James, uh, I'm running out of time. Uh, I have another slide. Now, next, um, 
As you can see from the slide, when can we say that the pandemic is over? Well, everybody's a very pessimist about uh, the pandemics are going to, uh, to be over. You know, everybody's uh, uncertain. So to this death, this traumatic pandemic has been already claimed the lives of more than 3.8 million people worldwide. And the numbers are increasing. So what, what we are praying that now we hope the pandemic is likely to fade away. This is what we want. Because, um, um, you know, um, the most important thing is the pandemic will high, uh, hinge largely on two factors, vaccination rates and the variants, you know. Uh, as, as fast as the vaccination rate is faster, you know, the, and uh, how we can control the variant, I think then we can, uh, we, we can control the pandemic from spreading. And again, next um, slide, we can see that national COVID-19 immunization program. And this is in Malaysian case. The impact of the lockdown is still let relatively early and much of the future of the nation will depend on the success of the vaccination program. So vaccination program is so important. Uh, so the faster, the better. And now this is uh, with the COVID-19 vaccination risk very greatly around the nation as well as within nation. In Malaysia, 54% of the adults have been fully vaccinated. but in the state of Sabah, we are a little bit slow, you know, in some state vaccination rates have remained low, especially Sabah. Now, as a conclusion, uh, Dr. James and all the participants, I'm so sorry that for taking some extra time. Now, as we can conclude, uh, this is just a conclusion and recommendation, I would say. I expect and prepare for more economic uncertainty and turbulence during the new normal. This is happening all over, not only in Asian countries. Um, and then the secondly, make the best use of our resources to meet the needs okay, of different groups in our society in a, a targeted manner. This is uh, policy makers to look into. And with financial stress, it is a good time to investigate option like uh, daily pay, subsidized loans, and access to financial support. This is some of the suggestion, you know, during pandemic because people are having problem, um, you know, with with their uh, income, with their jobs, with the financial uh, obligation, things like that. This is why uh, the government are giving mono moratorium to most um, people who are affected. By this pandemic. So with that, Dr. James and all the participants, thank you very much. Uh, this is what um, I can share with you this morning uh, as a first panelist uh, on this seminar. Thank you. Assalamualaikum dan salam sejahtera. Thank you, Dato, for your uh, wonderful overview of the situation and how we move forward from here. And uh, now, can we invite? Professor Durisha, uh, you have 20 minutes, Prof. Please. Thank you, Dr. James. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. A very good morning. I would like to take the opportunity to congratulate the faculty, of course, the Dean, Professor Dato, uh, Shabas Tahnia, Hatas, uh, this international uh, seminar or conference where we all are possible. Uh, to meet without much uh, spending so much money. Remember those days? Thank you very much, Prof. Yeah. Okay. And thank I would you. like to say thank you and uh, uh, salam perkenalan. Uh, happy knowing you, Professor Magatas from the University of Philippines. I was there in 2015. This is a long, long time ago. Like to go there again soon, okay? After the pandemic is over. <laughs> of course, I would like to... Um, uh, say hi to uh, Dato Shamsuddin. When I was doing my PhD, I used to meet all these key persons, and Dato Shamsuddin was there already. And I, I talked to him, I talked to all the MTU MTUC people, I talked to all the QPEX people, 
uh, Professor Magatas, I'm talking about the trade unions, okay? Uh, because the slide is just uh, for me to uh, share um, so that I don't run away from the topic, but I would like to share with Prof. Magatas and all my colleagues there, Prof. Bala also there, and all my colleagues there in a minute, some, uh, some things that is actually happening in Malaysia. So, um, and uh, of course, uh, the uh, organizing committee, uh, congratulations, Dr. Patrice is the one that I talked to. Uh, uh, congratulations to her and the team. Okay, so I just share a topic here. I say uh, COVID nineteen and impact on human resource management. But I must say this: uh, some has been covered by Professor Dato, and what uh, some have been uh, has been covered by Professor Magatas. So what is left? But I know that Dr. Shamsuddin, he has lots of other things that he will share that will be so much different from three of us, which is fine, okay? So next, James, let's see the second slide. Okay, I'm just going to share a little bit on the global economic impact because Professor Dato is the uh, professor in economics, so I can imagine what he was going to say and exactly he has said them all, okay? And the government role in Malaysia but also I can say that government role in Southeast Asia, including Philippines, uh, Professor Magatas, okay? And impact of the human resource practices, some of the, some of the uh, practices that have been changed, has changed actually, and is changing and needs to change, okay? And the impact on workers, the new norm on almost everything that uh, impact us, right? The work culture, the social side, the safety and security, as already uh, explained just now, the enhanced crisis like mental health. We do have mental health before, but now I think it is more enhanced. Uh, the, the, you know, the cases are much more apparent because of COVID-19, all right? And of course, there are a little bit on issues that relate to employment that I touch, and also if I have the time, also a bit on gig economy, but most of this topic has already been covered but never mind let's share a little bit more okay next james okay uh, we are experiencing covid 19 individually but we are sharing the problem globally can you can we imagine that we actually did not expect in our lifetime we may live in Malaysia, our you know uh, mortality rate. I think our you know uh, life expectancy is about seventy-seven years. Maybe uh, maybe if you are lucky, eighty. You know, so we never expect there will be a pandemic. All right, apart from uh, the nineteen eighteen has already mentioned by both professors uh, by Prof Magatas just now. You know, but we also did not expect a, a economic uh, a crisis as big as this, we see, which is actually maybe worse than the 1930s. That is how COVID-19 uh, as, you know, um, catapult or uh, as this, uh, you know, make the problems bigger, okay? Bigger, and we did not expect this happen, even though maybe one or two researchers or one or two, you know, uh, key persons like Bill Gates, maybe he has talk about, hey, look, we may have pandemic, let's do some vaccines, uh, inventions and all that, but we did not really expect it to happen and to happen it to happen at this scale, all right? So it has disrupted lives all across the world and communities and negatively affected global economic growth. So according to the World Health Organization, the virus reduced global economic growth to an annualized rate of negative 4.5% to uh, negative 6.0% uh, in the previous year with a partial rec recovery, just a partial re recovery of 2.5% to 5.2% if we are lucky this year 2021, all right? So the global trade is estimated already to have fallen by 5.3% uh, 2020, but uh, projected to grow by 8% but maybe this is not across the world in 2021. So there are uh, negative uh, uh, forecasts, but also we're looking at some uh, positive forecasts as well. Next. 
All right. So major advanced economies, big economies, uh, usually these are developed econo economies, which compress 60% of the global economic activity are projected to operate below potential output level throughout until about 2024, which will negatively affect national and individual economic welfare. Malaysia is uh, the developing world, still Philippines also, uh, Pramagatas is still categorized as a developing economy, right? So in ASEAN, in ASEAN, I think it is only Singapore that has been uh, 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 acknowledged as a developed nation in the whole of ASEAN uh, Association of Southeast Asian Nations, okay? So, but uh, looking uh, at the present scenario, two-track recovery began in third quarter of 2020 with the developed economies. That is a nascent recovery. If we look at... Uh, uh, um, United States of America during the Donald Trump, remember? When he was so against uh, 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 SOP, remember that? When he was against uh, vaccination, he was like joking around about it. He was, he himself never wear uh, only once or twice. He never, never really wear mask and he went around talking about why are we afraid of uh, COVID-19. And then, you know, um, uh, United States of America then once was the biggest uh, contributor to COVID uh, cases and really hold the highest death. I think now is I think uh, more than 600,000 US death alone. Okay, I don't think US has ever experienced that level of death uh, in whatever war that they have had before. All right, so that is the scenario. But in developing countries, we say we still lag behind. We have uh, we have uh, uh, challenges. Uh, Prof. Datuk just uh, shared quite a number of challenges, especially in the uh, ICT, in using technology, the digitalization of Malaysia, for example. All right? And then there are in, in resurgence of infectious case, cases. And we talk about this uh, variant, you know, we talk about Delta variant, for example. I think last week in St. Petersburg alone, in one day, there was a day at St. Petersburg in Russia, 144 deaths uh, alone in the in the city, you know. And then you know that at the moment we have the uh, Euro 2020 and uh, the, uh, the the football games. They're being held, you know, in many many countries. So people cannot wait to have the normal life. And you know, I, I watch it with my husband too. You know, the games, and I was like, okay. Wow, you know, certain countries they already open up. Certain countries, I think, just to make to to make the feel of you know we still can afford the normal life, um, like New Zealand, for example, where the cases is almost almost none because they have very high vaccination. I think uh, the the president, the uh, prime minister of New Zealand, Jacinda Ardern, uh, she was very fast in ensuring vaccination and taking care of the country. He was very quick about it. Once WHO said this is a pandemic, New Zealand, I think, took care of that. This is one of the uh, lessons learned, all right? Uh, uh, like for example, the boss of NBA uh, in the US, uh, he suddenly stopped all championship and that caused billions of losses for his NBA as a you know, money-making machine eh, uh, that make billions of dollars uh, with all the championship, but he stopped it. You know, These are people like what Datuk has shared just now with moral, with ethics. You know, What is most important? Is it still the economy or is it life of the people? So you know, we can see how this actually trickle down to human resource management, all right? And next. All right. Um, well, some of this, uh, I'm not going to repeat this, some of it. Let's go next, uh, James. All right. Estimated, okay. Uh, 95 million of our people across the world has gone into extreme poverty in 2020. 80 million more undernourished compared to pre-pandemic levels. And this is truly bad, I would say that. All right. So human cost in terms of life loss, will permanently, permanently affect global economic growth in addition to the cost of elevated levels of poverty, lives repented, careers derailed, and increased social unrest. In Malaysia, we are facing this. Uh, I would say, uh, but I think it is one of, in one of my slides later on, okay? So uh, let's go next, uh, James. All right. So 
Uh, through various phases of the health crisis, government adopted policies to lock down. In Malaysia, the debate is, are we doing lockdown 100% or part, part lock, lockdown only? So we have cases that never really go down. I don't know how many cases in Philippines uh, per millions of people, Professor Bangatas. In Malaysia, we have about 31 million Malaysians, about 4 or 5 million expatriates and foreign workers. Altogether, maybe all together, okay, plus the... Uh, uh, unregistered one, maybe about 35 million, but we have death of almost 5,000. And yesterday, uh, the 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 you know the data shows that we still have like uh, I think 6,200 uh, new cases. Can you imagine? And the government is saying until and unless the cases is below 4,000, we are not going to open. Uh, uh, we are going. We are not going to relax the MCO. This is the movement control order in Malaysia, and we are at the stage three or the phases three now at the moment. And many people are restless about this, especially the people who are running businesses, especially the small and medium enterprises. You know, the ones who are working by themselves. But I must say this before I forget. It is not there in my slide, but I must say this now to all of you listening to me that. If in Malaysia, the most impacted workers, the most impacted uh, 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 sector in Malaysia is the private sector, all right? As compared to the public sector employees, okay, as compared to the private sector employees, I would say that uh, I hope that Shamsuddin will, you know, uh, ponder more about this. I would say that the cases there, the, uh, the predicaments faced by workers in the private sector, especially especially the lower rank, the uh, ordinary workers are worse hit by the pandemic uh, impact, all right? Um, and then, of course, there is this uh, first phase, second phase, third phase. Uh, Malaysia is now, uh, like the rest of most countries, we are developing, purchasing and distributing vaccines. I would say that we are doing it quite drastically now, quite aggressively now because people truly are very anxious and every day the government is talking back to all people of Malaysia. Some are not listening, some, um, some are just very angry because some uh, maybe has uh, registered in March but still are not being called for vaccination. But many, 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 many more now I think are being vaccinated and this is really good for Malaysia. Then only we remember uh, the experts say that uh, vaccination is the key forward for us to be able to open the economy fully. Next. All right. Okay. Um, this is, uh, never mind. Next, uh, James. I'm trying to ensure that I finish within the time limit given to me. <laughs> I will try. Okay, James. All right. Ah, okay. The employers, they're very smart people. All right. Uh, we think the employers learn a lot about this pandemic, how to save, how to make their economy last, how to spend less. Because remember, there are lots of things that has happened that they have taken now, and it is within the law. It is within, if I talk about Malaysia, it is within the Malaysian uh, employment law uh, to do certain things, all right? So the employers are doing that now, whatever you call it, downsizing, right sizing, layoff, termination, or whatever. These are, you know, under crisis, when you cannot make profit, you are able to do this. Next, James. All right, uh, this is the one that I've just uh, mentioned just now. Uh, so I said here, uh, uh, using technology could be the permanent feature, even though we go, we go back to no, near normal. Later on, I think, you know, we learn that we actually can save. I just remember when we were doing international conferences like this, if we are all to go to Sabah now, and we invite Professor Magatas, and maybe we have one professor from Harvard, for example, or maybe one professor from Singapore, for example, and all of us from uh, the Semenanjung, Malaysia. We, 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 we love Sabah. All of us want to be Sabah, be in Sabah. I think the conference will cost Professor Magatas about, I think, you know, about 300,000 Malaysian ringgit. All right, this is something that we learn. Let's do more of this. Meeting of minds, but sitting here in the corner of my house. And Prof, you have your dogs around you, right, Prof? 
you you are there i just don't hear them barking you know can you imagine we can do this so this is the positive side but i can assure you the students are missing out the students the education the primary and the tertiary and university level they are missing out on the face to face interaction even though we may you know uh, use all kinds of uh, uh, social media now all kinds of all the gadgets that we now are quite expert in still they are missing out on certain things for example you know organizing things together going everywhere together doing programs together and making mistakes together and learning together and we can see the self expression that we miss that we miss and some of the more uh, professional uh, programs we are worried about the quality of the program truly some of the uh, professional bodies are relaxing a little bit uh, some of the things that before they say for example Malaysian engineering uh, 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 not associate council the councils all right uh, before they say all industrial training must be with industry the bigger the better the longer the better and usually they will absorb uh, students to work with them and they will look at the skills of the student in really really doing the, the the work you know so these are the new things that we are just learning we just have to accept you know even some of the board uh, engineering pharmacy you know maybe maybe not so medical uh, a bit relaxed there in terms of uh, understanding the pre predicaments faced by the lockdowns and students are uh, very much less uh, movements all right so next james all right never mind this next okay as dato has already shared just now only three days ago we have the pemulih this is apart from the prihatin we have all kinds of assistance at the moment i would say uh, malaysian government has already spent billions maybe already trillions of malaysian ringgit assisting the needy the B40, the people in need, okay, especially the, the workers who are being, you know, laid off, lay off or those who are not working at the moment of the small industry. So there are lots of economic stimulus packages in Malaysia. I'm sure there are also in many other countries to ensure that, you know, the bread and butter issues. We are not going back to bread and butter issues among the laymen of Malaysia and many, many countries across the world. If you read on articles about the United states or european countries even the uk you know uh, i mean developed nations it is more or less the same among the lesser people all right okay next okay what are the impact there are lots of impacts some have been explained by professor dato just now okay it has shaken all organization organization need to be able to prepare and allocate their resources to coordinate the needed mechanism what are the needed mechanism and to properly use the organizational resources and knowledge to their advantage at the moment what we call not just strategic human resource management but agility in the strategic being agile the you know the ability to move about the ability to change you know being as pragmatic as we can as long as your business is being sustained all right next all right uh, for example performing strategic planning or implementing the initial one can be challenging for both managers and all the practitioners all right uh, they cannot provide employees enough information about their management plan or their intended reaction toward the pandemic whereas having clear workplace guideline is very very important and this is one of the big challenges faced by practitioners all right next james all right the you know drastically altered working condition definitely work from home become the new norm it, it is already a norm before pandemic i just share you know remember just i want to recall this back among you scholars remember before the pandemic actually there were many research into work from home or flexible working conditions remember we were asking many organizations to do this but in malaysia not many organizations 
want to do this. There will lack of trust between employers and employees if we go by flexible working hours, working from home, you know, even though we say, hey, you can do this, this part work from home, but this part you have to be in office. Even that, in the past, before COVID-19, not many organizations were positive towards that. There were lots of mistrust among employers and employees. But now there is pandemic, this thing is being shoved down our neck. We just have to absorb it and live with it. This is one of the things that change that human resource management uh, practitioners have to take into consideration. How do you optimize performance? How do you optimize productivity in times of like this? All right. All right, next. All right. Already there are research, okay, uh, that say a uh, job task cannot be performed from home. Okay, those who say I cannot work from home, these people will lose their job. So it's a matter of not having much choice there. You know, even though you feel like going to the office, I'm sure from Agatas, you want to go to the office, right? I would love to be in the office. I have just moved my things from Johor to Kuala Lumpur. My place in Kuala Lumpur is so full of all my references. All right, and I'm working, I'm writing a book on uh, uh, workers in Malaysia and also on the trade unions. So, you know, two books project that I'm now working on, but suddenly I cannot enter the campus. I must be at home, you know. Only 20% can be in the campus with reasons, all right, at the moment. It is across Malaysia at the moment, all right. And those who stay on campus are those who did not go back. Uh, the students who did not, who choose did not go back because I managed them for uh, 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 the last year as the Deputy Vice Chancellor, I managed more than 8,000 students across Malaysia going by flight, going by bus, going back with very, very strict SOP. Then we were very happy, very one or two cases only. Now the campuses are closed because pandemic has entered campus, all right? So even professors now, we just had that we just adapt no matter how old we are the professors i'm saying you just need to understand and use ict now to the best advantage of all your students in your supervision your you know uh, teaching and learning your research and everything all right so uh, but the the last uh, the last uh, 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 paragraph there changes may have significant implications on employees mental health uh, and person environmental fit person environment fit before this, we those things matter, but now we just have to deal with it, all right? Mental health is on the rise. The feeling of not really liking it, you know, not really producing to the best of our ability. We just have to live it, to live with it at the moment, all right? And we are not having enough interactions, even though we do it online. You know, the job, job, job design is different. The workspace is different. Interaction with peers are not really there physically. Next, James. All right, all right, next. All right, okay. The new norm almost everything, all right? The first one just now we use technology, but then second we use, you know, uh, working from home, uh, but we need to ensure our people, uh, the human resource uh, management practitioners have to ensure uh, and to support them for effective communication, effective supervision, effective support. And then how do you do performance management and how do you realign, you know, their compensation with the amount of work, the quality of work, the performance that they de deliver back to your businesses. All right, next. All right. Uh, James, how much time do I have? Five minutes, good, okay. <laughs> All right, professors, they can be given two hours plus, okay? <laughs> All right, uh, for employees also psychologically demanding. You know, imagine I am 61 years old, I'm okay. I'm in the house with only my husband. And because he's so bored with everything, he went farming, you know, my husband. But I'm saying the young ones, just now I saw somebody with a child when we were taking photos, you know, the young one, they are having, you know, either babies or toddlers or young, you know, children or teenagers with them. And they are also managing their schooling. From Magatas, all over Malaysia, the schools are closed. 
So parents are managing the school system. The teachers are having big headache managing the education system in Malaysia because some of them, especially in the rural areas, they are not getting enough of the uh, uh, ICT, the the you know internet line and things like that. So there are broken communication there. So psychologically demanding in terms of family distractions be distractions because we have uh, commitments and we are there with them multiple roles at one time yet that you have to you have to play you remember remember this i'm sure you know now because of the covid 19 we don't know when our start of work hours right do you really have five to uh, five sorry uh, eight to nine uh, sorry eight to five i don't think so right I don't think so any one of you are still following the work hours because we are always answering. Is it midnight? Is it before eight in the morning? Is it, you know, after work, uh, maybe seven, you know? We are so attached to our smartphones, our laptops, you know? We are always, almost always online. We are so afraid to leave this behind. This is one of the a uh, big uh, challenge of COVID-19 because we are working from home. We still want to get attached to everything at all times. And inside here is everything, your slides, your research, your email, your WhatsApp, your message, your messenger, everything. And how are you going to deal with that efficiently, but still have normal life? So human resource practitioners have to think about this. How, how, how are their employees now, wherever they are? All right. All right. Okay, never mind. I'm not going to read uh, those. Next, uh, James. Okay. All right. Uh, most of us are not trained. I would say when the pandemic started in March 2020, none of us were trained. We did not expect it. So we were like in the first instance, like playing around. We, we think, wow, this will go away maybe in a week, you know. We did not expect it to be prolonged until the second year as an as as per now right next james all right these are the things that we have to care about what about staffing now you do you know a process of attracting selecting retaining competent individual how do you do it now right you have to do it online or only if you really really feel like the banking people they really need to be there the bosses then they go you know, some of the employees, they need them to be there in the bank. Yes, then they are there, you know. But the rest of staffing, recruiting, attracting, selecting, retaining, you most of the time do it now online. Okay, virtual recruitment. Next. Performance management. Before this, I'm sure you look at your employees. You know, you evaluate them. How they talk, how do they, the quality of work, you know, what do they get now? Is it on time? All those things. But now everything is online. How are you evaluating them? Next. Uh, next. All right. Tra training and career development online, almost 100% all over Malaysia. And I'm sure most countries doing training and career development online. All right. So, um there are i would say worries among some of the employees this is true research that you know because it is online because it is work from home their bosses may miss may miss looking at them being promoted you know may forget about them you know so these are among the challenges by human resource management practitioners next Okay, the same here, compensation management. Usually, you know, we have bonuses because people work long hours. You know, you give bonuses 2%, 5%, five months, uh, you know, uh, uh, bonuses because excellent work. How are you going to imply? How are you going to apply that now that everybody is working online from home? Next. Safety and health management, I think, has been uh, deliberated quite well just now, quite elaborate, I would say, by the Professor Dato. Okay, next, James. Okay, this is one of the things. Uh, Professor Magatas, you talk about trade unions, right? This is where I simply want to conclude this. Well, it is employment relations now across Malaysia, almost 100%. 
it is not so much industrial relations anymore. We talk about industrial relations when we know there are trade unions playing bigger role. I would say that now the uh, uh, participation of people in trade union activities are so much lesser than the last research that we have done, I think, you know, more than 15 years ago when there were only about 10%, 10 of all the workers are unionized. I am sure now it is less than percent, ten percent. I am doing the research at the moment, so it is more on employment research relationship. It is more whether human resource management practitioners do their job well, you know, with uh, more much moral, much ethics, much responsible, and much accountability altogether for the future of work or not. It is not so much about whether we have strong trade unions to cater for the needs of the workers, I can say that for Malaysia, all right? Okay, next, I think I'm already towards the last, there you are. I would say it is creativity and innovation for all of us for the future of work. The disruption of human resource management is happening. We can't help it. I'm, I'm, I'm proposing to everybody that roles of trade union in Malaysia especially is very much subdued, okay? It's very much subdued. Of course, we have the tripartite system. We are still propon proponing, proposing, uh, and proponents of tripartite system. The you know the harmonious relationship between government employers and employees. We we still are okay, but there is the great disruption. People are talking about: Do we have food on the table? Can I pay for my children? Can I send them for education? You know, do I still have work? Instead of you know every three years we want the collective bargaining. You know, the collective agreements to be renewed. You know, okay. So it has pushed us organization to rethink about our strategies beyond traditional models. And maybe, maybe for Malaysia especially, we need now to relook again uh, over new legislations in some of the laws that we inherit from the British uh, 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 61 years ago. Okay, with that, Dr. James, thank you very much. Colleagues, okay, I hope I share a little bit on the human resource management uh, impact uh, by the COVID-19. Thank you very much. Salam alaikum. Thank you, Prof. Thank you for keeping uh, with, uh, with time, our so very punctual. Okay, so uh, our next uh, panelist, uh, the captain of industry, uh, we would like to invite uh, Datu Haji Samsudin. Datu, are you ready? Okay. Yes, uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Moderator. Uh, Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi Very good uh, morning to all present, uh, participants, uh, panelists, and Dr. Amanti. Yeah. And of course, uh, you know, the topic given uh, here is you're talking about uh, security of work after COVID-19 pandemic. But the one million dollar question, uh, ladies and gentlemen, is that are we going to be able to end the COVID-19 situation? Uh, and of course, uh, I would say we are in this game for the last, uh, I would say, one and a half year. Are, are we nearing the end? I, I think I think it is not like that. It is still with us. And of course, uh, I think uh, what some countries have done, for example, like Singapore, they say stop to stop worrying about uh, the COVID-19 pandemic. Let us just stay with it. Let us just live with it. And we manage the pandemic as if it is just a common flu. That may be uh, the situation that we, we will be in uh, eventually, ladies and gentlemen, and, and we may not be able to really uh, end the pandemic. But having uh, having said so, first I'm interested with what uh, Professor Raisha had said to say that, yes, possibly we need uh, a new legislation to actually uh, protect the workers. Yeah, yeah Professor talked about protecting the workers, but about protecting the employers, Professor, yeah? Because uh, I think employers currently, uh, I would say, in a deep, uh, I would say, financial problem. They don't even talk about trying to make profit at this time. They just want to say, yes, uh, you know, let us uh, be allowed to operate our businesses so that we can actually 
maintain our presence not not making profit not 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 even talking about those kind of thing yeah we are, we are lucky if we are able to just get some revenue to actually continue our presence uh, in the in the industry and and you know that many companies many employers actually had no choice but uh, just just uh, say goodbye to the to the situation and just 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 live like that yeah? and and i think this is the reality currently that that we are facing and of course uh, this is just to to talk about uh, the situation that actually uh, that had been uh, touched upon by uh, professor datu kasim and also professor raisa uh, you know when we are talking about the impact of the pandemic uh, will over yeah and of course uh, what what is important for us to say is that uh, you know we realized that there were many job losses during this period and actually malaysia is not uh, spread up out of these uh, job losses later on i can just share some data on how uh, malaysian uh, employees are actually losing their job and of course uh, you know how malaysian employers also are not able to sustain their businesses yeah and and of course in terms of uh, economic growth thing like that i think really we are being in a very challenging situation yeah uh, last year we are, we are talking about negative growth and of course uh, people say that hey you know we, we thought the pandemic is not going to be with us uh, any longer possibly when 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 it first uh, came to us somewhere in early uh, part of last year we, we thought that it is just something like uh, we will we, will we'll come and go kind of thing but but little did we realize that it is still going to be with us up to date and of course uh, many uh, quarters are very pos positive that 2021 will be different that's why i think the economic projections that time are talking about even up to 7.5 times uh, gdp growth thing like that but of course uh, recently the world bank had said that you know 7.5 for malaysia is too optimistic possibly it's going to be 4.5 kind of thing but looking at the current situation uh, looking at the, what we are currently uh, i think even for us to achieve 4.5 uh, personally i would say that is going to be very very challenging because the, the current situation is is not helping us either yeah. And of course, uh, this is just to, to share uh, the kind of losses that the country had suffered arising from the uh, pandemic. Yeah, we we actually in the first uh, phase of our MCO, we lost about uh, 2.4 billion ringgit every day of the MCO. Yeah, so when we had that MCO up to the end of May 2020, we are suffering close to 100 billion losses yeah and of course uh, yeah if you look at the mco3 that we actually had uh, implemented from first june 2021 uh, of course uh, many quarters are actually uh, saying that our mco is a bit relaxed you allow 17 economic sectors to operate thing like that this so you can see that there are still a lot of uh, workplace clusters uh, being 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 uh, being uh, facing the country and of course, uh, if you look at the losses currently we suffer, of course, is reduced more than half. We are suffering about uh, 1 billion ringgit per day. But even that also is huge losses being faced by, by the country. And of course, as a country, I would say that we can ill afford to actually uh, still absorb this kind of losses. And of course, it's just to, to, to share where we are. You know? Where we are when we are talking about the, the kind of... Uh, of uh, job retention that we are able to do uh, during this period. Yeah? We, we can see that, say for example, in, in most sectors of the economy, we are, we are saying that uh, possibly we are going to see a reduction in in uh, number of people uh, who are being uh, losing their jobs. Yeah? So for example, like in the agriculture uh, and fisheries, you're talking about 21 and 33%. Even in the services industry, yeah, of course, we are talking about average of 15%, but, you know, if you talk about the F&B side, the, 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 the percentage of people losing their job will be very much higher. And, and of course, uh, for, for industries, we are quite lucky that some of the industries are doing uh, very well uh, during this period. So, for example, those people involved in 
uh, PPE manufacturing, thing like that, the rubber glove industry, they are, I think, smile, smiling all the way to the bank. That not many industries are like that. Yeah? Many employers, generally speaking, are actually in a very uh, difficult position. Yeah? And, and this is uh, actually the survey done not by MEF, but by the, uh, by the government, the Department of uh, Statistics. Yeah? Close to 70, 68% of the companies said that during the MCO, uh, they are not allowed to work thing like that. They don't have any source of revenue. Yeah, and, and that is critical. Yeah, and how do they operate uh, during that period? So close to seventy percent say that they use uh, their, their savings to do that. Yeah. So, but how much saving do they have to actually be used as working capital? And most of the companies, I would say, ladies and gentlemen. In the Malaysian context, yeah, we have about uh, close to 800,000 registered and active employees. These are the figures from the EPF, yeah, uh, that, that they are contributing to EPF. Yeah, they are talking about the formal uh, sector employment, formal private sector employment. And, and the number of the so called micro enterprises, of course, when you talk about SMEs, uh, their numbers are about 98% uh, of all the registered companies. But when, when I zero into the smaller companies, the micro enterprises, these are really small, small people. They are talking about uh, employing uh, five and less employees. The number really is huge, 650,000 of them. Yeah? And this 650,000 of them can hardly survive beyond two months without any revenue. Yeah? So, if you lock them out for, for more than, than, than one month kind of thing, then the likelihood, likelihood of them folding up is really very, very high. And of course, when you're talking about unemployment, uh, this gentlemen, yes, you know, uh, we, we are actually uh, facing, uh, I would say, high number of um, unemployment. Yeah, and, and even, uh, say for example, currently we are lingering about more than 4%, 4.3%. And, and of course, uh, you know, in the Malaysian context, for the last 15 years, we are talking about uh, unemployment of less than 4%. And in terms of uh, international standard, we are actually in a full employment situation. Uh, but of course, uh, currently we are, we are no longer in full employment situation. And if you are talking about youth, the people that come out from the higher education institute, thing like that, yeah, the number of unemployment is really alarming. Yeah, they're talking about 12.1% of these people are not employed. So, so this is something that I think we need to really uh, face the, the reality and see how best actually we uh, as a country, you know, employers, uh, the, 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 the society, and also the government uh, see how this can be addressed. Yes, uh, Professor Raisa was mentioning about the, the private sector uh, employment being uh, being uh, important. Yes, uh, in terms of employment opportunity, yeah, uh, the employers in the private sector offer about nine, uh, ninety percent of employment opportunities. The, the government, the public sector, offers about about ten percent. So, so, so if if actually uh, we, of course, uh, you know, if we are in, in, in the business of uh, running university, for example, and if our programs are not really uh, geared towards uh, meeting the requirements of the private sector employers, but we are gearing more towards the public sector employment, then I think we are missing the boat. I think we do respect because then it's going to be very difficult for the students to actually fit themselves into the uh, employment market, which is mainly uh, in the private sector. Yeah, but as as private sector, yeah. Remember, uh, Professor Duresa was trying to say that okay, look, let us protect the workers more. And and this is as a result of protecting the workers more. You see, say the the the, the government say, you employers during the lockdown, you must pay full wages. No, 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 no debate about it. Yeah, but how are we going to pay full wages to the employees? We don't have any revenue, or if there is revenue, it's very much reduced. So that the problem with we, we, uh, currently what we are facing is that with the lockdown, even if the employee is allowed to operate, 
the demand for our product and services is very much down. Out there in the market, the consumers are actually more thinking of trying to uh, save whatever money that they have. Yeah. They are not going to actually buy new clothes, for example. Uh, you know, just, just say, for example, during the last Hari Raya, I didn't buy even a piece of new clothes for myself. And everything is, uh, you know, stand still. We don't buy any cookies, thing like that. It's, it's like that, yeah. And, and of course, the whole economy is actually at a standstill. And of course, here, uh, what is important is that we are talking about the supply chain. Yeah. Of course, I was thinking, I was, I was just now mentioning about the small timers, SMEs, thing like that. But if the big timers, yeah, the big brand owners are actually uh, not able to, 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 to uh, survive. Just imagine the kind of impact. The whole supply chain will crumble. And of course, you're talking about, I would say, uh, loss of employment for so many people, actually. And of course, here, uh, you know, MEF is, of course, uh, trying to do, actually put some sense to the authorities to say that, okay, look, if we don't have any revenue during this period, but we have to actually pay for our fixed overheads, how are we going to survive? How are we going to sustain our set? Of course, one of the big big ticket items as far as fixed overhead is wages. It's all right if we do pay wages, but if the employee also uh, you know put in their 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 their, their pro produce and thing like that, of course we, we can sell and we can get revenue, thing like that. But if the whole thing is disrupted, but you are expected to actually just continue to pay your 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 wages fully, and this is where I think that the equation is is really not right. And of course, yes, uh, I would say that, yes, we need to, to have more, I, I would say, legislation, but legislation that is flexible enough to actually cater for the good and the bad times. So if, if in good times, yes, we do pay full wages, we pay bonuses, but in bad times, then I think there ought to be some form of sharing of the burden also with, with, the, with the employees and also with the other stakeholders and even uh, with the government. That's why... As MEF, we, we say that we need to call a lot of flexibility in terms of allowing companies to actually remain in business to, to keep the employees in, in employment. Because we, we know that if we actually end the employment of the employee concern, yes, it's simple for the company to say, yes, because of this, I'm going to retrench you. I want to going to, to let you off. But what about the employee? For him to get another employment is going to be very, very challenging because most employers out there say that, okay, look, uh, you know, we are, we are having a, a wage or, or employment freeze kind of policy and we're not going to actually employ any new people. Yeah? And of course, uh, this just to share the, the kind of uh, uh, employment losses that we have. Yeah. So last year, we, we lost about 107,000 uh, employees. Yeah, we, we, we terminated them, we retrenched them. Yeah, and you can see that uh, you know uh, the the high number of people uh, who are retrenched actually are the professional, the managers, the executives, and technician. Yeah, and that I think is critical. These are highly qualified people, but employers are not in a position to maintain them. Yeah, and and, and of course, just to to share this uh, with with, with uh, the uh, audience about the impact of COVID-19. Suddenly, employers realize that, hey, we don't have these people to come to work like that, but our things are still okay. So really, do we need these people to be around? Or shall we just retrench them for good kind of thing? Yeah, of course, hopefully that kind of thing doesn't happen. Yeah, And of course, uh, this issue about uh, job losses, ladies and gentlemen, still continue, even up to date. But you can see that uh, the numbers uh, are not as uh, very alarming as compared to, to last year, for example, uh, the, the one in, in, in uh, blue color, yeah, the, 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 the light blue, yeah. The one in red color up to uh, June uh, 18 is, uh, I would say, you can see that the downward trend, and this far we actually had been losing uh, about 32,000 employees. Uh, uh, we let them off, yeah. Uh, and of course, uh, our, our only hope is basically to say that uh, these people should be able to be uh, doing some economic activities. They may not be in employment, but if they are able to actually take up some form of economic activities, doing something of uh, income generating activity, then I think they should be able to sustain themselves 
uh, during this period. Yeah? And of course, uh, this is just to share about the, the pessimistic uh, uh, outlook of the SMEs. They don't see any kind of, of uh, I would say, uh, you know, chance for them to really survive during this period. Yeah, and and of course, uh, if 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 uh, things are not really changed, then of course uh, things may be more difficult. Yeah, so of course, uh, government actually had come up with a lot of uh, I would say stimulus packages. This uh, uh, that professor and uh, professor Durais also had mentioned about this. Yeah, so as a country, we actually had uh, actually spent. Or the government had pumped in not more than 20% of the Malaysia's GDP to support the economy during this period. When I say support economy, is you're supporting the 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 the, the rakyat, you're supporting the employee, the B40, the M40, and even now the higher ups also need to be assisted. That's why you can see that uh, in Pemulih, for example, as far as the bank moratorium is concerned. Every borrower, big and small, will be able to actually ask for bank moratorium. And actually, finally, the government realized that not only the small players are being impacted, but even the bigger employers are being impacted. But it is gentlemen, all of these are actually temporary relief. Yeah. How long can the wages subsidy uh, be, be assisting us to survive? Two months, four months, three months, and even under Pemulih, for example, it is two months uh, when we are in phase three. Or, I mean, when we are in phase two, but we are still deep in phase one now. And if we ever go to phase two, then only we can get the, uh, the two months uh, which subsidy. And, of course, if we do get to phase three, then uh, those companies that are not allowed to operate will get another two months additional assistance. But... I like say this these are temporary and employers are really very much eager to actually come out and resume their operation yeah? and this is where perhaps you can see that of late uh, quite a number of uh, statements made by MEF to say that what we are actually uh, seeking assistance from the government is to allow companies that are not in the red zones yeah to actually start to operate so that we can actually uh, start the, the, the ball rolling. And by, by doing so, then we are able to actually sustain ourselves. And by sustaining ourselves, we also say that we are also trying to assist the government to stabilize the labor market. Yeah? So, so that is, uh, I would say, very, very critical. Yeah? So I'm not going to go in details about the, all the Pumule thing like that. And of course, uh, you know, Apart from all these things, yes, we say that yeah, most employers are suffering, things like that. But yes, uh, on the other hand, we also do have some kind of, uh, I would say, ray of hope because some of the companies are able to actually be very agile and adapt to the new requirements. Yeah? I still remember the story of uh, the farmers from uh, Genting Highland. Sorry, not Genting Highland. You, you don't do farming in Genting Highland so much. It's uh, the Cameron Highlands. Yeah. Uh, when the government imposed the MCO uh, in, in March, suddenly they, they say that they are not able to actually transport their produce to the market. There's no transporters, nothing. So the next best thing to do is just to throw away their produce. Yeah? But luckily, you know, quickly the uh, online platform came to their assistance. And within two days, their products are actually online and people buying from, from them. So there is a need to be a lot of agility in that sense. Yeah? But, but, you know, our laws are founded in uh, 60 years, 61 years back or even beyond that or more than that. And of course, uh, we are expecting that law now to actually, uh, you know, uh, guide us along at this time. And obviously there are a lot of, of I would say, misfits, I, I would say, then that is why I think there is a need to really relook at the laws, not only to protect the employees, but also to protect the employer side so that we are able to actually make sure that we can survive the, the, the pandemic. Yeah. And of course, yes, I mean, like hypermarkets and the grocery stores are, are doing, uh, I would say, good, and they converted into uh, online uh, shopping, thing like that. Yeah, of course, those uh, communication uh, apps, thing like that, are doing quite well. Yeah. And of course, uh, I think now we need to stay back at home very much. So 
you know you have uh, you know a lot of spare time to watch the the, the TVs, the media thing like that, and and of course. Uh, the other part is that some of the companies are involved in the uh, the, the protection of uh, of life uh, actually very much uh, also making I would say good progress during this period. Yeah, and and of course the, the other part, ladies and gentlemen, is uh, when you talk about the realities of employment. Yeah, even if the employers are offering employment, they no longer actually employ on full time basis, full time permanent basis. If at all they do employ people, they would offer more on shorter fixed term contract, not even one year, maybe six months, maybe three months, maybe one month. Yeah, and and this really, of course, uh, you know, is something that is not expected of the uh, the of the by the employees that they are going to be in that kind of position, and some of them just refuse to accept uh, any offer that is uh, not considered as Full time em employment. So, so that uh, I would say is uh, the reality that we are facing uh, now. And I, I would advise uh, the job seekers, people who are looking for a job, to say that whatever offers the company actually make, they, they should seriously consider that offer so that uh, that platform should be used by, the, by, by, by these people to prove to the company that they really can contribute to the growth of the company. And because of that, then they should be made more like permanent part of the, uh, the the company. So so that I think is something that I think a chance that need to be uh, grabbed by the by the by the job seekers. Of course, the other part that the new reality that that we have is basically to say that okay, look, you know, employers are paying uh, very minimal at this stage. A lot of comments, a lot of I would say. Uh, Allegations against employers that we are trying to to actually use the pandemic as a base to actually offer very low wages, sometimes even below minimum. I can say that, you know, employers cannot actually employ people below the minimum wages level. Yeah, so that I think is very clear. And if any of the employees caught doing that, they can be penalized. But if the employer actually pay 1002, generally speaking, yeah, uh, even for graduates, for example. You know that is the reality, ladies and gentlemen. Yeah. So, so I, I, I can say that. Okay, like I said earlier, you know, let us use this opportunity to prove that they can do deliver uh, the, 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 the work for the company. And I'm sure in the private sector, starting pay doesn't mean a lot of thing actually. Starting pay is just the starting pay. And if you prove yourself to be to be good, if you prove yourself to be of uh, value to the company. Then the company will review the wages in no time, you know, two or three times even in a year. Yeah, of course, in public service, you, you can't do that. You expect don't expect that to happen. Normally, they say that yes, you know, the, the pay review will happen every year, thing like that. So, so this I think is something that uh, you know we, we need to really uh, be be looking at the new reality, new new reality as far as as employment prospects are concerned, and of course, uh, you know. Where is the security if you go for fixed term contract, shorter fixed term contract? I'm sure many of the audience actually had, uh, you, know, uh, you know, read this uh, news piece yeah, about the predicament of the medical doctors who are on fixed term contract. You know, this happened not just uh, during the pandemic, but way back before the pandemic, starting in somewhere 2016, yeah, where these, these people are actually uh, being being employed on fixed term contract and their employment is always on a yearly basis and fixed term contract means that they are not able to do a lot of things you know they cannot take any loan they cannot actually go for further studies thing like that and of course at the back of their mind then they, they, they will still feel that okay look hey whether next year i'm still going to have my job or not so that is something that is very very critical for them yeah and of course, uh, you know, uh, we, we can say that actually maybe tomorrow or a week later, they wanted to really show their, their displeasure on this particular issue. We are talking not about just a small number. We are talking about more than 23,000 23, contract doctors that, that they are talking about. And of course, they are seeking more like permanent employment. But in the private sector, 
uh, ladies and gentlemen, even if you are on fixed term contract, does it mean that you don't have any job security? No matter what in the private sector, I, I'm sure uh, the, the, the uh, audience here is quite familiar with uh, the, the setup of our industrial relations system, our industrial relations act, yeah? and, and under our section 20 of the IR act, any employee that feels that he had been terminated without just cause and excuse, he can always file a case at the industrial relations department to seek for reinstatement. Does it really matter whether you are on fixed term contract, whether you are a probationer, or things like that, you can still go to the uh, IR department. And of course, with the changes of the law, which was implemented on 1st January this year, if the matter is not resolved at the industrial relation department, then the case will be referred to the industrial court for adjudication. Yeah, so in terms of trying to enforce your job security, yes, I would say that it is still there. Yeah, But the only thing is that, uh, of course, uh, you know, uh, you know, the employee need to actually really use the, the legal system in trying to actually uh, uh, try to protect their, their job rights, basically. And of course, uh, you know, uh, when, when we, 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 we have all this kind of thing, uh, of course, we, we feel that there is a need uh, of a better collaboration between the private sector and the Ministry of Education and even the academia, so that actually we are able to give our input on what is really required by the private sector to actually, uh, you know, make sure that when the, the, um, the when the, 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 the graduate actually come out, that they are ready to actually really contribute to the company. Yeah, I, I think uh, this is uh, even in every aspect of the education itself. Yeah, of course, we, we, we are saying that possibly, yes, of course, we do respect to the uh, academic uh, courses, thing like that. Uh, I think now what we, what we really require is more of the the technologist, more of the TBET. Yeah, that's why the, the government actually had also set up the Majlis Negara for TBET, so that we can be guided very much in trying to mainstream uh, TBET education, so that uh, you know we will meet the current need and also the future needs. And, and of course. Very important, uh, ladies and gentlemen, you know, the government also is trying to roll out a 5G by the end of the year. And 5G means, of course, it gives a, a lot more opportunities for company to move on the value chain, uh, introduce uh, digitalization, thing like that. And we need a lot of people to actually man uh, the, the backroom services as far as uh, digi digitalization is concerned. Yeah. And of course, uh, you know, the last thing that employers uh, actually uh, want to see is uh, increases in doing cost in in the cost of doing business. That's why we even at this stage say that you know there shouldn't be any review of uh, minimum wages, which is due for uh, February next year, because we say that uh, we are currently very much struggling. We even uh, uh, depend on the subsidy of the government to survive. And of course, we shouldn't be imposed with a lot more costs on it. And, and of course, we need to really rethink on how we actually can uh, move forward, we can go forward. And of course, the important part is that basically, we need to actually uh, need to have a more resilient and agile workforce. And of course, uh, we, we need to actually also as companies, as employers, to actually invest more in technology yeah? and also uh, upskill and reskill our employee, and of course, we also need to, to talk about uh, social protection, yeah, which is also critical because we don't want to see that people who lost their job, people who actually retire, are left uh, unprovided uh, for. Yeah? And of course, uh, what what we, we really require is, uh, you know, when 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 if at all we come out from this uh, pandemic, yeah, if not. Let us uh, live with 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 uh, COVID nineteen, yeah, and and of course we need to be more careful. And of course uh, we we hope that uh, not many companies uh, will actually uh, uh, shut down the operation. Last year there were more than thirty two thousand companies that uh, shut down their operation. Hopefully this year it is it is better uh, in that sense, yeah. And of course uh, what is important is basically what what we call for the government is trying to 
assist company to actually start to operate their businesses. Yeah? But of course, with a more stricter compliance with the SOP, so that we actually can assist the government also to reduce in, uh, uh, unemployment and create more jobs. So, well, of course, what had been announced by the government to say that in the first half of this year, the, 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 uh, there was the ability of this uh, labor market to create more than 248,000 new jobs. That is very encouraging. And possibly we may still be on track to actually create about half million jobs this year. I think with that, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for giving MEF the space to actually talk about the issues facing the private sector employers. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dato. Enjoy your presentation a lot. Uh, now is seven one, so we have I mean for the closing one each of to the panelists. Anyone, please? No takers? Can can I can the moderator ask a question? <laughs> okay. I yes, would like to uh, ask Dr. The... James, yeah, you are allowed to ask questions. Okay, you, yeah. I, I would like to yeah. ask a question to the captain of the industry. Dr. Samsudin, uh, you mentioned just now about uh, our medical doctors being contracted by MOH. Um, and this is not good, uh, if I understood you well. And uh, the thing is, uh, Malaysia used to hire medical doctors from Burma and India, you know, and Pakistan. Sometime, even now, our faculty of medicine actually is more than half the professor teaching our own medical student actually from outside. So in that case, how come our own medical doctors cannot go and work outside? Why they always be waiting for a job, job security in Malaysia? Thank you. That's a question. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Moderator. Yes, uh, I, I think it's the situation that, uh, you know, do we require these people? Yeah? Do we require the doctors to still serve the Ministry of Health? Yeah? More than 23,000 of them. Yeah? And of course, uh, every year there will be about 4,000 new doctors graduating from the, the, the School of uh, Medicine. Yeah? And, and imagine yourself uh, being, uh, being a, a, a medical student that graduated. Yeah? And of course, uh, in order for you to actually be called as a doctor that can practice, you must be accepted in the Husbandship program, and even that is very challenging. I know that there are some, uh, you know, uh, medical students that had to wait for more than one year just to get a slot for husbandship, and that I think is not fair. I mean, personally, I think it's not fair uh, coming from the private sector because the student had spent a good four years, and they had spent a lot of money. They borrowed money from PTPTN, more than three hundred thousand, more than four hundred thousand, and they had to pay back this kind of thing, but. When actually they graduated, they more like back for the job, you know, which I think, I think the, it is it is uh, something that shouldn't happen really. To me, they should be offered permanent employment because the positions are there. Twenty four thousand of them are serving the government now, and more so now during the pandemic, they should be appreciated because all these twenty three thousand are the so called frontliners. They are risking their life. They are risking their their their. their themselves to be you know treating the the, the people with uh, with uh, COVID-19 situation yes they can always go somewhere else but but you know uh, you know the situation is basically they still prefer to be closer to their parents they want to be closer to their their siblings here and they would prefer to actually serve the country if it is possible yeah but uh, I do really hope that this matter can be addressed, uh, I think, in, in, uh, in a successful and, and a fruitful manner, and also to the satisfaction of everybody, so that I think the situation is not prolonged. Because uh, if things really gets up out of hand, 
And then I, I, I would say that it's difficult for us to actually face the situation. I, I know, uh, you know, there are some uh, countries that allow even professors to go on strike, things like that. They allow doctors to go on strike like that. But I hope this really doesn't happen in Malaysia. Thank you. Yes. Thank you, Dr. Uh, Dr. Okay. James. Dr. James. Any questions? Dr. James? Yes, yes. Can I ask a question? Yes, go ahead. Uh, yeah, my, uh, I think I'll be a long question, but I think that I can ask and answer. Thank you, Dato. Come today, my good friend, Prof. Durisha. Thank you. Go there. Okay, uh, for Dr. Kasim, uh, I want to ask a question about, uh, can you explain the recent scenario of graduate employability in Sabah, especially during the pandemic? And uh, the recent issue that, uh, you know, indicated uh, our graduate, I think, uh, underpaid and even to the uh, minimum wage. I believe the most of graduate in, in Sabah, I think about 70% of our students studying in UMS and the rest 30%. And I don't think so. They are out of the Sabah. So what happening to them? What are the job opportunity for them? And I, I'm worried that there will be a lot of, uh, uh, they will go for the low paid uh, salary, which is not uh, good. Okay, next question to Prof. Durisha. After listening to Dato Samsudin, what is your suggestion, advice to union and employers and MOHR on the minimum wage? Do you think that the government will impose minimum wage at the rate 1,200 and 1,000? Any suggestion? This is a pandemic. People are suffering, uh, including employers and also uh, employees, especially SME, the micro. For Dato, I think I'll ask one question, Dato. How to balance uh, employers? And the union employee needs during the pandemic, especially you look at the prosperity vision 2020 and SDG, SDG eh? sustainable development goal. Do you think that the productivity link based system to upgrade from the guideline to a code of PAWS? Do you think the employers are ready to this? As you said, no work, no pay, but but the law enforced must be pay minimum wage order uh, according to order. Also, please comment our graduate uh, because they use the text taxpayer dato private sector but they spend three or four years they study they have all kind of skills soft skill uh, you know technical skill all skill but when out of the job they're jobless and they are going to the uh, lower pay which is i think dato is not appropriate because uh, we are we are training them which is very high cost and suddenly they go out of no job which is very sad i think i believe they should go for higher income and that's why i propose plws to be imposed give them KPI, they themselves out of the uh, job after six months because they cannot perform, they out. And then we know that there is something to be done at the university level or whatever. At the university level, we've done our best. I think Dr. James, Dr. Kasi, all of us here, even Prof. Zurich, we do well, but how can uh, retrain again? Dato, I don't know. Why place and train again? No point. But Dato, I think Damsuri always uh, agree that uh, Dato said no need to place and train. Suppose the training is done in the university. Am I right, Dato? And then again, we spend money. So this is a what that we have to think. We already talked about this ten years ago. Again, we talk about the same issue, and then the money was wisely used. Okay, that's all. I think, uh, Mr. Chairman, maybe summarize lah. Just summarize. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, Dr. Uh, Kasim, your turn first. Dr. We cannot hear you. No, no sound. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, for, for okay. Uh, very good question. And actually, if I, I'm going to answer your question, it will take some time. But I would like to condense or give a very brief um, explanation to the question why we have a very high rate of unemployment among undergraduates uh, in Sabah. And you know this issue has been there for many many years, and this is um, as my capacity as the economic advisor to the state government. We've been uh, have a lot of engagement with the state government recently. You know, um, I think with the political will, um, with the political will, I think in a few years time, uh, we hope that the new government, the present government now would like to have uh, more investors coming to Sabah so that the job opportunities are available to our graduates. Now, um, the policies are not in favor of Sabah because we know that Sabah is very rich in natural, natural resources. We are the leading producer of oil palm in Malaysia and we are also the highest 
uh, producing oil and gas in Malaysia. Um, second is Sarawak and Terengganu, Kelantan third. But yet the poverty level is very high in Sabah and and as well as unemployment rate among uh, our graduates. And they are actually, uh, our graduates work below their qualification. Well, uh, as I mentioned to you just now, uh, with the political will, we want to have all the big companies who are in Sabah to relocate their head headquarters in, in Kota Kinabalu or in Tawo or Sanakan, because most of the headquarters um, of, of all these uh, big uh, plantation players are all located in uh, Semenanjung, you know? Uh, so all the high paid jobs, all the professional jobs are all uh, located outside Sabah. Uh, uh, this is one of the things. And then the second one is that um, uh, with the current uh, governments now, uh, we want to modernize all the infrastructure. I think this will attract many investors coming now investors um you know reluctant to come to Sabah because the the poor infrastructure available is not really um you know conducive for business environment and the cost of business is relatively very high so but inshallah um in a few years to come uh, after all the infrastructures infrastructures are on place i think this will Position Sabah again one of the most attractive destination uh, of investment, not only for domestic but international investors, uh, foreign direct investment, because of the position of Sabah are very strategic. And when you are talking about Bimiaga, you know, uh, not very much uh, Brunei, Indonesia, the Philippines, and uh, um, Malaysia. Uh, Growth Asian sub regional growth area, um, nothing is you know to you to offer because these are the areas, um, relatively speaking, are underdeveloped. Um, most of the like you are talking about the Philippines, the in Binano is one of the underdeveloped areas, and we are talking about Indonesia, Kalimantan is also another area is underdeveloped um Sabah Sarawak as well uh, only Brunei so we are talking about lots of things need to be done um within the Bimiaga area and then uh as, as I mentioned to you just now um we have lots of uh human resource capable and competent human resource the only thing that if the, uh, these undergraduates um are willing to to move out from Kota Kinabalu, I think uh, the chances of getting uh, employability is very high. But most Sabahan, uh, the graduates, um, you know, they prefer to work uh, in Kota Kinabalu uh, or, or in, in certain in their home hometown in uh, around the state. Um, but soon, um, it, it it only take few years. Uh, you know, to position Sabah again so that uh, to reduce the unemployment rate now currently is 4.5 percent. We want to make it uh, as smaller as possible of undergraduate unemployment in Sabah. So, with the political will, I believe, and the I believe uh, in the future, um, with all the uh, with all the you know, um, um you know, the policies, the right policies uh, are on place, I think we can position Sabah again uh, to be one of the attractive place for investors coming. And this will offer many opportunities for a uh, job opportunities for our graduates. Um, that's all I can um, share with you uh, with, pertaining to the question that you uh, forwarded just now, the Prof Bala. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Thank you. Uh, can we invite Professor Durisha? Uh, you have two minutes. Two minutes. <laughs> okay, two minutes. Uh, okay. Prabhara <laughs> and colleagues, uh, we must have, uh, you know, a minimum wage. This 1,200 has been discussed, I think, you know, way back when, you know, during TUN, 
when he started. I think MTUC has already proposed to tone uh, in the, his first round uh, as the prime minister a long, long time ago. This is not uh, to live uh, quite comfortably. 1,200 is just, you know, a wage eh, to, to, you know, for a person uh, to just maybe, you know, for the basic things in life, very basic thing. In fact, uh, in the in big cities in Malaysia, you cannot afford to live with 1,200. So my first answer is yes, we must have it. Just now, Dato Shamsuddin said, uh, hopefully it is not going to be reviewed soon. Well, we understand the situation at the moment. We hope the situation at the moment is like this, that is quite uh, temporary. Uh, but we need to get back to that Malaysia that we dream for, where salary is a level where it serves the needs of the citizens. Or, you know, international standard is quite acceptable. We cannot be, you know, satisfied with just people, uh, uh, you know, a graduate, for example, 1,200, uh, truly, we cannot. And then uh, we cannot even uh, cater for basic things, meaning education, uh, uh, house, you know, uh, transportation, simple things, you know. So for me, it is a must, but we need to review it. In times of good, we need to review it. In times of bad, as per, at the moment, I understand what Dato Shamsuddin was saying. Well, in the States, in the States, many of our people, international people are working there, not really 12 months, 12 months per year. I have a friend with the husband there in Washington there and also in Virginia there, Malaysian and Indians. They stay there, they work only nine months. The, three, the, the, the last three months, they don't work, they don't get paid at all. But with that nine months, they are okay, you know. They, they know they live comfortably. They can buy house, they can travel the world. They, they have a, a chuti, a holiday for three months. This is happening actually in many developed nations too. Hopefully Malaysia is like that. Uh, hopefully we will arrive at a time where we do not care for minimum wage because we know that is, you know, just a standard at the moment to live by. All right? James, I hope I answered your question to Professor Bala. Thank you, Prof. Dorisha. And uh, Dr. Samsudi, what's your take, please? Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Moderator. Uh, Prof. Bala, we are very much a part of the uh, minimum wages team. And of course, uh, based on the study, did by the technical committee uh, for the 2018 minimum wages order. Uh, the finding was to say that uh, 1.1 million workers benefited from the new minimum wages order in 2018. Honestly, ask ourselves, who are these 1.8, at uh, uh, 1.1 million uh, employees that benefit from the minimum wages policy at that time? Now, are they local workers or are they what? Yeah. And I think we know the answer very well because at that time, we have more than uh, close to 2 million foreign workers in the country. Yeah. So, so I, I would say that that is the kind of policy that possibly is a bit uh, misdirected. And, and I, I, I would say that, uh, you know, as far as the policy to uh, use uh, minimum wages to alleviate poverty within the society, uh, I don't think that really works in that manner because uh, these people are really not benefiting from the uh, minimum, whatever minimum wages policy that we, we had introduced. Yeah? Uh, coming back to the uh, graduates, uh, low pay thing like that, yeah? perhaps, uh, you know, uh, we need to actually uh, now perhaps uh, change the way we think of, about uh, employment and, and uh, wages, thing like that. Yeah. If employers are not able to uh, provide or offer you with a, a, a salary that really matches your dream, matches your desire, why, why take up employment at all? I, I would say that now I think a lot of opportunities out there for entrepreneurship, a lot of opportunities there for them to develop their new businesses, thing like that. And you don't have to start big, you can start small, the new starters, the, the, the gig economy, thing like that, the, the capital outlay for, for them to actually come to uh, enter the, the, the business is uh, not very, very high. And I would say take that opportunity yeah, while the times is, is right now. And of course, if you're talking about employment in the private sector, 
I would say when times are good, yes, of course, you can expect them to be somewhere at uh, lower or, or mid-level management kind of positions, things like that. But let, let's just see, uh, you know, what, what really happens to the to the undergraduates when they are in uh, studying in Japan, for example. Yeah. Uh, that side, when, when you are even in your first year, you are actually being sent for internship. Like, not as compared to Malaysia, you know, you, you have your internship six months before you, you graduate, thing like that. You know, this, that nothing much can be done really at that time. Yeah, But from the first year, they went to the company to do internship. What did they do? Are they doing high profile job, thing like that? No, they are assigned to look after the toilet. So why is so great about looking at the toilet? This just to actually create and build the attitude of the student themselves towards job. Yeah. Appreciate what other people are doing. And of course, later on they move on to other areas. And by the time they graduate, they know that the in and out of the company's operation. And of course, these are the kind of people that really the Malaysian employers are trying to look for. People that actually don't uh, put uh, you know, wages as the main thing when you want to actually come to employment. Try to build up your career from the lowest possible level, and hopefully, inshallah, you go to the highest level, become the CEO, thing like that. And if you're able to do that, then you will be very much better worker. Yeah. So, so I think that's just my short answer to what Prof Bala had had raised. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Dato, for your no hold bar comments. Uh, now it's uh, 11, 12, 12, so. Before we adjourn, I would like to express our gratitude and thanks to the three panelists, uh, Dr. Professor Kasim, Professor Durisha, Dr. Samsudin, and uh, on behalf of organizing community and the faculty, once again, we say thank you. And I hand over this session to Dr. Oscar. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much, Dr. James, and to our three distinguished guest speakers for the fruitful um, <clears throat> panel session just now. Yeah, thank you so much, uh, Dr. James, for moderating the session as well. Yeah, so uh, I think we can proceed to our last um, agenda of the, of the seminar, okay, of, for this morning. Yeah, that is the conclusion and the announcement of the best, best paper award. Yeah, and for this matter, I would like to invite Yang Brusaha, Dr. Rosili Asid, the Deputy Dean of Research and Innovation, to announce the best paper awards and also to close and conclude the International Seminar on <clears throat> Human Resource Economics with the theme of security in work, uh, security in work after COVID-19 pandemic. Yep, so I shall pass the floor to Dr. Rosalie. Yeah, thank you very much, Dr. Oscar. Yeah. Uh, being our uh, MC for this morning. So, Dr. Andy, if there is uh, any list that I need to announce for Best Paper Awards. Yep. I think Dr. Much. Andy is uploading. Yeah, the Best Paper yeah, Awards. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 So this is the uh, announcement of best paper award, the uh, what we call the much awaited moment that everybody uh, waits since this morning. So uh, I believe there is a uh, three categories for this uh, what we call the announcement. For research category, the uh, winner of the research category best paper award uh, goes to Li Jingyi for Mitaka Furoka, uh, Beatrice Lim, and Hairul Hanim Pazim with the paper entitled. Uh, a moderating role of travel experience on the risk norm intention relationship during the COVID-19 pandemic regulations. And the second one, uh, the second uh, paper goes to Nor Fazbin Fabil, Karul Hanim Pazim, Juliana Langat, and Rosina Mahmoud with the paper entitled Entrepreneurship as a career option among graduates during pandemic necessities or opportunity efforts. Congratulations. For, and for the next category, uh, this is the category for conceptual paper. Uh, the winner uh, is Karihanim Pazim, Rosina Mahmoud, Beatrice Lim Fulgi, 
Lepas Linda Fabi dan Junan dan Langat, di paper yang terakhir, The Impact of COVID-19 Pandemic on All the People in Malaysia, a review. A regulation. Second one. Uh, the uh, second winner of this category goes to uh, Mr. Charlie Albert Laswin and Aziza Omar with the paper entitled Save the Best for Last Branding During COVID 19's War. Congratulations. The next one uh, this is the category uh, of uh, student uh, articles. Uh, the winner, the first winner, goes to Muhammad Yusuf. With the paper entitled Analyzing the Impact of International Labor Mobility in Indonesia, the Policy Implications. Congratulations as well. And the last one, I believe, uh, the winner is Lau Jeng Pao, Angela Talon Wan, Irene Lo Xiaoling, Lim Pui Hua, Luciana Ding, Muhammad Arif Afizi bin Muhammad Hashim with the paper entitled COVID 19 and Work from Home Effect on Workers' Productivity. Congratulations to everybody. Yeah, thank you so much, <clears throat> Dr. Rosili, for announcing the three categories of the best paper awards. Yeah. Now I would like to invite uh, Yang Brusa Doctor again for the closing remarks for uh, the seminar. Yeah. Right, thank you again, Dr. Oscar. Uh, Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. A very good afternoon and a very warm welcome to all delegates, colleagues, ladies and gentlemen. I believe that we have all had a, a fruitful talk today. We gain a lot from the uh, keynote session presented by the excellent keynote speaker and the panel speakers who shared their insightful perspectives on various labor challenges during the pandemic at the International Seminar of Human Resource Economics 2021, whose major theme is security in work after COVID-19. I would like to uh, thank all presenters and participants who have joined this seminar virtually from all over the world. Uh, the keynote and the uh, panel speakers acknowledge that the COVID-19 health crisis has escalated in a global economic crisis, threatening the uh, health jobs and earnings of millions of people throughout the world. Country moved quickly to provide unprecedented level of emergency assistance to keep individuals and business businesses afloat, protect jobs and uh, incomes and uh, keep the economy from collapsing. Countries now need to do everything they can to stop this job crisis from turning into a social crisis. Uh, this comes to the conclusion that rebuilding a stronger and more resilient labor market with improved uh, job security is a critical investment in the future and the uh, future generation as well. I'd also want to congratulate uh, the Best Paper Awards winner. We believe that this award will inspire the brightest mind to create their best work. We applaud the authors and their outstanding work. Although this speech marked the closing of this seminar, this seminar is not yet over, I believe. We yet to listen to uh, uh, 30 papers being presented in uh, several concurrent sessions uh, in this afternoon. So do take this opportunity to share your ideas, insights, and knowledge uh, through constructive discussion and presentation. Ladies and gentlemen, as the Deputy Dean of the Research and Innovation of the Faculty, uh, I would like to take this opportunity to express my gratitude to the main organizer, the Human Resource Economics Program, for their full efforts in making the seminar a success. I hope that uh, this seminar will continue in the future, bringing more intriguing labor concern to the table through strong collaboration between academia, industry players, and stakeholders. I would like to congratulate the organizing committee for the animus work behind the scenes to ensure the success of this very prestigious seminar. I wish all the participants a very fruitful and a productive session and will benefit uh, from presentation and discussion uh, at this seminar. Ladies and gentlemen, I would like to close my remarks and officially announce the end of the seminar, wishing everybody future prosperity and health with the recitation of uh, Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. 
I declare the event closed. Thank you and stay safe. Back to you, Dr. Oscar. Thank you very much. Salam alaikum. Yeah, thank you so much, um, Dr. Rosili, for the closing remarks. Um, we appreciate your attendance, Doctor. Yeah, despite your busy schedule.